Welcome to another episode of the Tea and Trails podcast. It's episode 59. This week we chat with my hero, Lucy Gossage. The minute I saw her name on the spelling list, I messaged her. I'm oh, ready. Uh, do you need any tips? Do you need tap tips? Uh, I'm not shy. <laughs> I loved watching her training. She was incredible out there. She talks really candidly about the race, battling those sleep demons over the cheviots. Oh, made me really emotion and reminded me why I never want to do that again. Yeah, we're so lucky to have Lucy on the podcast this week. So hold fire. Let's get through the boring bit. Gary talking and then we'll rock on to meet Lucy. Oi, 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 straight oh, away, yeah. Eddie. Yeah, but you weren't <laughs> listening really to what I was saying, were you? So your face was a bit like deadpan and then suddenly you realise that I was... <laughs> Big shout out to our Patreon partners who share some awesome discount codes with you. We have Precision Fuel and Hydration, Vela Forte, Protein Rebel, Tiki Boo, Mountain Fuel, Outdoor Active, Silver Sweden, Active Root, The Centurion Running Store, SportsShoes.com, Big Bobble Hats, X Miles, Bornside Farm Cottages, Yugoku Projects, Red Bear Sports, The Alban App, Retainer Group, Cycle Protection, Summit Crazy, and Ultra Trails 2. Extra shout out to Precision Fuel and Hydration, Vela Forte, and Protein Rebel. We use their products every month to help fuel, hydrate, and recover. If you'd like to save some money and support our podcast and our partners, then please consider joining Patreon. We couldn't do this without you guys. Also, pop over to Summer Crazy if you'd like to buy some awesome tea and trails merch. Thank you to Precision Fuel and Hydration for sponsoring this week's show. Gary? Have you ever tried the sports fuel, two raw eggs, two shots of brandy and one dash of streak, strychnine? Oh, is that what they used on the uh, 1904 Olympic marathon? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Believe it or not, Gary, it's what they used on the 1904 <laughs> men's Olympic marathon uh, by gold medalist Tom Hicks. Tom Hicks was technically the second man to cross the finish line, but the chap who finished ahead of him was later disqualified for jumping in a car for a section of the course. <gasps> They've been doing that since. 1904. Given that strychnine is a highly toxic chemical used as a pesticide, it's perhaps no wonder that Hicks collapsed shortly after he finished and was too unwell to attend the medal ceremony. <gasps> Well, if you want to know more about this, pop over to Precision Fuel and Hydration. This week, they're talking all about the history of sports nutrition. Education, 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 Gary. I love it. (laughs) The Greeks got a mention, though, about, uh, was it figs or dates? I can't remember what it was now. Some 200-meter sprinter fueling themselves on uh, I love a fig. Not so much on a date, but a little fig keeps me going for about five minutes. But dates and figs. Well... If you are a patron, you can get 15% off and anyone can get 15% off their first order over a precision fuel and hydration with the code T24. That's super simple, T24, as in a cup of tea, not just tea. Tea, cup of tea, cup of tea. This week I had delivered my box of uh, weekly tea bags by a lovely man and I said, don't judge me for my tea habit. Don't judge, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. And he was like, it's all right, love, it's Yorkshire tea. I was like, oh. Bit of tea smuggling. Hope no one from uh, Customs and Excise is listening. It's all legit. It's all paid for. Don't worry, Gav. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you, there was some, uh, it's, I think the, the Finns, there was some issue with cheese going over to Russia. Anyway, the Russians were smuggling in the Finnish cheese to Russia. If you Google it, Finnish cheese, Russia, you'll see lots of photographs of cheese stuffed in compartments in cars and stuff like that. It's quite hilarious. Is it nice Finnish cheese? Well, is it? Is it cow, goat? Cow. I think it's cow. cow. Yeah. <laughs> well, we only have one type of cheese. They're probably subtly different, but it's not like us where you go into a like a deli. And there's just loads and loads and loads of different types of cheese. There probably is. Apologies to any Finns listening. There's four the four, there's four types of cheeses in Finland. Rajusto is a Finnish version of cottage cheese. Ooh. None of that. None of that. Squeaky cheese? Yeah, squeaky. We like the stuff that's in a big round. It looks like a yeah. big salami. Yeah, le batjutsto. Oh. You Finnish sound cheese. more Russian than... <laughs> well, that's because they're sort of so closely <laughs> They're very close. That. They're very close. Anyway, enough reminiscing. Enough cheese rem- talk. <laughs> Enough cheese chat. <laughs> that was your week. I loved your little WhatsApp video you sent me. Oh, oh. I thought I'd send it to you so you could understand when I was describing the jeopardy of watching this, yeah. that you would feel my fear as my the son and heir was 
putting his own life into his hands. It's anyway, so fast, I couldn't believe it's so it. So fast. Anyway, let's we'll river, we'll rewind. Rewind. Uh, yeah, it was another B plus week, Gary. It happened. Some sessions happened. Some sessions didn't. I I just feel quite weary at the moment, and I'm there's a there is a reason for this. It's totally I know, mum and dad, totally self inflicted managing work kids and the my heavy addiction to the weight room means that like it's just so tired gary it's so tiring being this good looking and um but <laughs> it's exhausting <laughs> it's exhausting <laughs> but i started the week with a medium long run that my monday runs i'm just gonna go mondays they never feel good they never feel good yesterday when i was running no, it's a really steep hill but i run up it all the time and i i don't need i get out of breath running up it but i always run up it and yes i couldn't run up it gary i was like oh god it's, it's too steep are you I'm poorly? Too tired. do you think you're poorly or just no, super tired? it's just just lazy but you've gone in heavy a monday on a medium long run i like Wednesday. to i like to kick i like to kick start the because i'm going to disappoint myself by the weekend so i like to start with pleasure <laughs> at the start only to, yeah so i like a I like a really easy medium long run monday and then you sort of got some miles in the bank and it's a quite a day for me generally on the work front so i can then go home and do boring stuff like mopping floors and folding <laughs> folding laundry i had a good long long run but again my legs the weights are just killing off my legs so i've got to step back a bit i'm going to give it another week and then i've got to step back on the weeks because the running up the hill they're like oh, i can't do it i'm so yeah, we're trying um, to run. We're just trying to run. But then I'm like, well, I don't need to run up any hills on the Northern Traverse, do I? Anyway, snap True. out my lecky poles and off I go. It was a good long, long run. I mean, long running around here in the winter is so boring because you can't go anywhere. When, you, when you're when you like uh, encased by beautiful mountains, you know the trail, like normally a long run in the summer is just joy, five hours. Yep. Yes, please. Every day. But three hours around here in the winter is the same track I run on every day. You can't really yeah. get anywhere. So you just have to do out and backs. So you're either running uphill or downhill. And just people, you know, my feelings about people. And uh, so they, it is a bit dull. We have our little WhatsApp group. So I try and get a bit company for those and just... That's why I like the lakes, because you can go high, but in the window when the weather's poop, you just say maybe jump on the Lake 100 route and you can do some low, low trails. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. I, I did get up high today, first time above like 1,000. I reckon I got up to about 1,800 straight up, you know, my classic, Ooh, the, what, yes. the, the path that goes straight up behind my house, which I love. Ooh, I used to, when I was taught direct training, I used to like, that would be my every day. And I did it once today and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I was looking, you go through woods and then you can see the daylight like coming. Uh, and I was like, where does that top bit? It seems a very long way up here. But I'm going to start to, now there's snow at the top, but it's like only, it's only knee deep. So you can get through. So I'm going to start putting that back in, get those hiking, get those steep heights back in again. I did a strong, yeah, good strong hill effort. Didn't quite, there's this Strava crack that's eluding me gary and it's bugging me he's Where got it I... I can't believe he's got it yeah but then i like look at the person that this is do people do this is this really sad i look at the person who's got it and i'm like yeah. you did like a really slow run how did you get that crown i know some people will specifically go to a point to get a crown yeah but then you can't see the then i even analyze the data <laughs> i'm like you didn't see that anyway so i tried to get this crown but i had lindy with me and uh, a bus was coming down as i was going up and I, you know when you want to get a crown you just can't there's like even like two or three seconds and yeah. i had to pull over for the bus lindy got it i was like oh lindy we're never gonna get this crown now <laughs> anyway it was still good i still was blowing oh, i did my 4020s on the bike that's like good and loads of of five mile runs i've been having a bit of a love affair with a five mile run at the moment gary it feels it's like it's a total classic if i go over five miles it tires me out for the rest of the day i could do five miles and then i've off my body feels better it yeah. feels less creaky and i don't feel like i've been running i can spend i can then someone said to me have you been running i'd be like oh i don't know if i've been running anything over five miles especially around here because you'll also got the climbing in as well eight miles t 10 miles Maybe that's why I think, you know, seven, seven for me seems like that's a seven. decent Seven, it's run. probably about the same time. 
probably about yeah. the same time. It's probably about just like between 50 and 60 minutes, depending on the route that I choose. And it's, ah, it's a couple of lovely ones. And I was like, oh, I feel so good. Also, I think mentally, you know, when you've only got like when you're doing mega runs and then you just have to go, oh, I just got to do 45 minutes. You're like, yeah, that's just easy. Well, especially when you've done your medium run and your long run, then 45 oh, minutes. I like, just take it off. Hey. It still wasn't a massive mileage week. Um, but I just, with the strength in there, um, I don't know if I've mentioned that, but uh, <laughs> it's just, that just has to take. And I keep going back to Jack Scott going, that's just my units of time. One of my units of time went with a sports massage. So I was like, in old Eddie would have added in and that would have just been an extra thing in the day. But I was like, no, that's my session block. So I yep. lose that session there and and I'm going to rest. And the strength, I just, the strength is this. I mean, the session is the strength. It's not going, it's not, this is not conditioning, as I as I know I've said to people. But I don't want people to think that just because I'm doing like this is normal, I'm doing this because my have been running all my life and doing sport all my life. And this is a this is a new, like working this hard in the gym. You don't need to do this, everybody. It is an experiment I'm doing on my body, but also I'm able to do well. This is debatable because I can't run up hills, but I am able to do it because I've got a background in lifting and yeah. strength work and stuff. So if you are new to running or new to the gym, yeah, no, 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 you don't need to do this sort of stuff as well. It's all super varied. Did you listen to Coopcast this week about? Do I? Uh, I don't like the way he throws everyone under the bus that he doesn't like and is not in it. I don't like that. He, I just <laughs> well, I just thought it was it. interesting. He's, I'm not going to give you the full details. You listen to it. Okay. But was basically comparing, uh, I think it was marathon run, French marathon runners who did a strength. Oh, yeah, there's a study. There's a study of French marathon runners and French. And there was trail runners. runners. Yeah. And they. I don't think the trail runners did strength. And apparently the trail runners were stronger. If I've got this right. Of course. Me. Apologies. Yeah. Even though they, they But this is what I thought was interesting. You would think if there was any kind of intervention at all, that would give you some benefit. But the marathon runners weren't seem to get any be any benefit over the trail runners for going down the gym and doing strength work. Yeah, but then what would that? I'm like, yeah, but they don't need. To, they're like, they'd be like, yeah, but I don't need to be that strong because I don't need to do like the power up the 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 descending the attacking up the hill i just need to be able to run a five minute mile on the road and so True. i've got the strength to do that so they in some ways it's like yeah but they're totally different sports so of course yes it's not apples for apples True. it's not but then, so but then, I, then I saw kipchoge with his on his uh abductor machine doing completely different <laughs> exercises to me so it's it's what it's it's not quite the wild west but yeah oh I it's wild west. It. and well even in the gym i just i entertain myself watching People come in, I'm like, what? Are you doing? Eddie, you're so judgy. I'm so, I am, un if you had a speech bubble above my head when I'm in the gym, oh, I am so judgy. I'm just, I'm not judgy. I'm just like so entertained because also our gym is full of a lot of people that have just come on holiday. So they don't know where anything is. Maybe they don't really have a routine or they're out of their routine or they just want to do something different to skiing. And then it's just so, I'm just like, what? They sort of get the machine and pull something. And then I'm yeah. like, well, you. You've not got any weight on that cable that you just put. And they haven't even attached the hand attachment yesterday. He was just like pulling the hook and there was no weight on it. <laughs> and then, or I watch people like squatting and stuff and they're full. I'm like, oh, and sometimes I go, because oh, I see their knees and stuff. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Oy, anyway, oy. anyway, it was a good, it was a good week. I left one of my treadmill sessions to Sunday, Gary, and I didn't do it. I couldn't do it, Gary. I couldn't do it. Oh, you inspired yeah. me to do my treadmill session well, on Sunday. Well, you know, that's what I'm here for. I'm here for inspiration. <laughs> I had to do my gym on the Saturday, which pretty much that was big. And then that sort of wiped me out on Saturday. Uh, and I did an eight mile run too. And I was like, so on Sunday, I'll save this is, and I'm not doing this again, Gary. I'm not doing it. I'll save my treadmill till Sunday afternoon when we come back from skiing because it'll be dark, it'll be cold. Uh, yeah. Kids will just want to watch TV and I'll just go on the treadmill. I'm, and I convinced myself I would do it. And of course I didn't. Not because I didn't, I actually didn't have time. Anyway, we spent the day, the weather up the mountain. We spent the day, we were at 2000 meters in a snowstorm for approximately, well, we went up at nine and we skied down at three, six hours. We had a quick coffee. I felt pretty blown about Gary. It was pretty, it was a pretty emotional, uh, visibility the, from that, visibility the, the, the video you sent was atrocious it was the first day 
so Sunday, so people arrive for their ski holiday on Saturday, they get all their skis and then their first ski is normally on a Sunday. So the piece are full of people that haven't skied. Woo, 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 woo. People <laughs> all over the place, people, parents skiing with their kids and for night always laughing going, the kid is better than the parent who can't keep up and the kid is in the snowplow. Not only that, but the the visibility was zero to nothing and it was sort of coming and going so you'd be able to see so and the snow it had rained and then it had snowed so the snow would be like ice snow slush but you couldn't see it anyway because you couldn't see anything my least i if i if i'd wanted to go skiing i would definitely not have chosen that day because really busy no viz and horrible snow and i i know i said this before i get i get like this travel sickness now where i i can't like you when you because you sort of have to just go with the snow and you're going up and it's like being on a roller coaster and I don't choose to go on a roller coaster. Anyway, yeah. we were up there to watch my eldest son do his ski race. And as we're going up on the chairlift, higher, higher, higher. And they they do all their training in this sort of like but really exposed. They're right in the side of a mountain. Just the odd avalanche off it. Only once has training been cancelled because the avalanche came over a small child. Oh, my God. Um, so they do all their training on this same piece, which is closed. It says piece closed for competition, piece closed for training. But it's got a really big piece to open on the other side. And people just ignore it and ski down and a couple of times people then ski, they they can't stop when they're racing they're skiing so fast um a couple of times people then just ski under the fence and go across and they get oh my god they're getting such trouble anyway we were watching oldest child do a ski race is it boring me talking about my kids and what they're doing should i talk oh, more about them running <laughs> <laughs> people enjoy it. I was like, last week i talked all about the ice skating and this week <laughs> anyway i was thinking should i not touch I just well they can talk about me doing Eight times, yeah, five minutes okay, on my okay. treadmill. <laughs> Let's not do that. Uh, so um, Finley's had a roller coaster ride with his skiing. Do you remember? Oh, a few yes. years back now. He didn't get the funding to be in the top um, group. He was the only one who didn't get the funding. He had a bit of a rough season, end of season. Um, and his time's got a bit off growing, whatever. We don't really know why. Just just didn't get this chance. Anyway, I was the one who had to tell him that he hadn't got this funding. Mm. Oh my God, it was the worst thing I've had to do. And that, and that I'm really sorry, because obviously people have had much worse things that they had to tell their kids. But I had to tell him that, you know, his life wasn't going in the direction that he thought it was going to go in. And he was the only one that didn't get this funding. And so he had to watch his friends go off. So they get funding to go on what we call stages, which are like weekends away training all through October and November. So they would leave college and he'd be left in the classroom by himself and he wouldn't get, he wouldn't get to go. That is tough. And, For his time in life, that is mega Well, tough. 12 when you're 12. Yeah. And he'd be like, go up the mountain. This is last year. Uh, go up the mountain and he wouldn't have a coach. And they'd just be like, right, well, Finley, you just ski round. And, and not only all that, but then you, breaking. yeah, you're not in that group of kids. Um, but you know what? He carried on. He worked. He worked. He worked. And of course, because I saw this, and um, being when I was PE teacher, I and mean, this is why I hated doing sports scholarships when kids were like eleven and twelve. I would refuse. I'd be like, you cannot choose because the kids that are best at sport will not be the best of sport come fourteen or fifteen when testosterone kicks in, yeah. and you shouldn't put the pressure on kids at that early to to say you're really good at this. And you're not, basically. He never complained. He carried on training. He carried on training. He's got better and better and better until he has started beating the kids in this that have had all this extra skiing. Slowly started beating them, slowly moving up the ranks until he is about often third or fourth place in that group. Oh, wow. Uh, Fantastic. Goes to show exactly that it doesn't work. Anyway, but he's never made the podium in a race. And his, uh, his brother is a is it comes easy to his brother and not so easy to Finley. And uh, he skied like an absolute, so they get two runs. They have to ski both runs. If they fall or they miss a gate, then they don't get any result, which is awful. So you have got to do it twice, like having to do, right, you got to do this 50 mile twice and then we'll give you an average time. pressure. So uh, the visibility, as you know, where I sent you the video, we could see him start. um, So we could see him come out the hut. You can't really see on the video, but it's an, it is like a, just a wall, a wall of ice and we could see like the first four or five gates and then you can't see he just disappears into the 
into the cloud. So there is an app on the French ski webpage where you they go, I said this before, they're going on the court, they're on the course and you can see that they're still skiing and then it comes up with their results. So I just watched him start on the first run and I got this app out in this absolute blizzard with my head up and freezing fingers. Anyway, and I thought he'd done not great. I was like, oh God. Skied down to the bottom and he's absolutely buzzing. Oh my God, mom, I'm... Uh... I thought, oh, he's going to be... Ugh. And he's like, oh my God, I'm second overall. I, go I didn't get enough speed. And it, the change in this child from like, he doesn't really want to do it. To, you know, he's, the racing is racing and it's just what he does. To be like, yeah. I can get more speed up. I can get more speed up around this gate. And I was like, okay. I was like, right, let's, well, let's just get down it. Should we just get down? My difference. I was like, <laughs> it, just get down it. You can just get down it. You, he was about half a second off the guy that was first. And about three, they were about three or four seconds behind everybody else. And I was like, just... Okay. just just, just go easy. Just mum. He was like, no way. I'm going to go hard. So we then, uh, okay, we left him and then the weather really came in literally. So we were standing halfway down and we couldn't see, we could have seen nothing. I was like, oh my God, I could see him at the starting gate about to start thinking, but uh, my child, I had to make the sign of the cross, Gary. I had to go back oh. to my Catholic religion and go, just make him safe. Just please get him, just, just get him down safe. Oh my God. Oh my God. I don't care. I don't care. Anyway, the minute he came out the starting gate, he was so balanced. He was like, never seen him skied like that. Never seen him like, I was like, he's got it. Yeah. I never like, I was like, oh my God, he's got it. My God. Uh, all that worry and everything disappeared. Off he went down, skied like an absolute legend. Finished in second place. I know you're all dying to know. Got on the podium. 0.18 off the guy in front of him, who's like one of the oh. best skiers in Morzine. So he was app. He was apps. Oh, I was like, this, this is what Sparta's all that is absolutely buzzing to get a really crappy <laughs> so trophy. Sure. It doesn't uh, matter. Doesn't that's matter. the, exter that's matter. the external, it's isn't it? It's oh, all the external. It's all about the process and the fact yeah. that. So then yesterday, he finished school early, of course. They did have a rest day yesterday for the first time in ages. And I said, meet me uh, meet me in town. I'll get a piece of cake to say well done. And we're walking down the road. And I was like, you, you know, Finlay, I'm so proud of you. The moment I told you that you haven't got that funding and you've never given up you've never complained you've worked and worked and worked for like two years and you're there and he was like oh this recipe they've changed the recipe of this <laughs> it's just I was like, okay so this is really like this means so much to me and absolutely nothing <laughs> to you but uh i was just happy that you know life at sport if your kids are sporty or if they're not sporty just hanging in there keep encouraging them keep showing yeah. them you just keep turning up when you can't run up the hill because your legs are so trashed from 40 uh jumping lunges just keep going just keep turning up each day so he made my week so there was a lot of jeopardy in that Sunday. By the time we skied down oh my god Gary the snow had turned to this sort of like liquid mush Finley was almost crying. He never he never gets tired from skiing. I was like, oh my God, my legs. They were the moguls were like bigger than Evie's head. Uh and we were trying there were so many people. Oh, my legs were absolutely fried. And I thought, I'm going home. I'm gonna get on the sofa. I'm gonna light the fire, fire up the old laptop. Cup of tea. Not, uh, a cup of tea. I'm not moving. <laughs> I'm not moving. I made that decision. I'm, I've am i made that decision quite a lot in this training block where old Eddie would never have done that. But I've just been like, I don't really want to. I want to I want to sit. I want to rest. I visualize that sometimes on the way home from a run thinking, cup of tea, laptop, oh. have a good little Rex. <laughs> Hey, Tarky, my long run was, we, we covered about 21 miles on Thursday. Tarky, she did it. She had a moment, the last few K, when she was like, I'm done, mum. I'm seriously done. And Ooh. we had to run past the van. And I was like, should I just leave her in there? But I don't like leaving the dogs in the van by themselves when I'm not there. Mm. Um, and I was like, well, just come on. Let's just run up. You know, I, I told her it was 5K, but it was actually five miles. <laughs> uh, she, on the way back down, she was a good, this is going to be like you on the recce, Gary. She was a good 40 minute, 40 metres behind going, I am no, worried about the no, recce. <laughs> no, I don't want to do any more. Yeah. Yeah, so another week ticked off. Good, good, bad highlights. Uh, what a winter this is proving for family Sutton. So now we had a bit of snow, Gary, and that's it. No more snow. They've banned ski touring on the piece, so no more ski training. Not that I've really 
embrace that at all this year because it's been so rubbish but I'm like oh well that's good because I don't I'm not going to do it anyway so I think oh the other thing I did oh I'll tell you that later that's it that's me not well, what not, a champ what a champ Finley is you know aww. talk about inspiration talk Take about yeah exactly isn't it cool that your kids can be even though they couldn't get less it's like this cup <laughs> this carrot cake's changed recipe but I love that reality I love the reality <laughs> of it and it's like it's not all just focused on on that it's like yeah cupcakes rubbish yeah. Cupcakes rubbish, but I'm a champ. Yeah, it's super cool that he even like he's only got one more year in the ski system and then life has to change a bit. But the fact that he's gone through all this, all that training, even if he then goes off and becomes a cricketer or whatever, do the work and don't focus on the actual what's happening at the time. Focus on where you want to be. The other thing was the bravery, the brave like I was. I was quite scared skiing down a blue piece without being able to see anything. And Bryn was like, yeah, but they haven't got anyone on their piece and it's totally smooth. So they can go really fast. And I was like, Finley, were you not like, how could you see like where you were going? He's like, mum, we're going so fast. I can't see anyway. It doesn't matter. And I'm like, my kids are so cool. You're so much cooler than me. Who like, right, let's talk about proper running. Proper running. Well, yeah, see, I just go into the deets. Don't I go too deep into the deets. But first thing I want to see, I Googled Leon. I was curious. I was super curious. And uh, I think you owe them a, an apology. I, I don't. Nice little... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you Google anything, Google herpes, you're not going to get the worst of... Well, let's assume about that one. <laughs> don't do that, kids. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, I told you. I said Leon Old Town is really nice. That wasn't where we were. Okay. Okay. I'm going to send you a picture now. You keep talking. I'm going to send you a picture <laughs> of where we were. <laughs> well, the week started, the training, I suppose, started. I had a steady run to do, which uh, not necessarily marathon pace, but marathon effort. And I was on the flat trails and I must admit, I came, I've got my notes here, morale destroying run, dot, dot, dot. What, can, I, we, can we dive a bit more into this pace? What is your pace? What was the pace? Oh, I could just it. It was over seven minutes, uh, over seven minute mile for every... But that's, that's good not, on trail. You haven't even got your fast enough. Well, yes, that's yeah. I didn't have the carbon plated shoes, and it was, it was quite. It was a trail, but it wasn't. I had a dog. It really wouldn't uh, leave me alone. I thought it was going to attack me, but it just wasn't fast enough. But fundamentally, it was not fast enough for a six mile run. So I came away feeling pretty down in the dumps. And then, yeah, Thursday. So not really workouts, but Thursday, filthy weather. I had a filthy cold. I've still got a bit of a hangover. <laughs> From that cold, and I was in the podcast trenches. I had something to do earlier in the week, so I couldn't do any editing. Uh, so I left it all Thursday. And that's yeah. jeopardy because the well, podcast goes out Friday. Same, same with my treadmill. <laughs> we all learn. And I didn't want to get a nasty email from the boss saying, where's the, God, <laughs> where's the, where's the podcast? She is that's all. nasty. No, <laughs> no thirsty Thursday. I was not happy. And um, I didn't do any workouts. And on reflection, when I was there at 11 o'clock at night, making sure the podcast was ready, it was a good job. I didn't go and do any workouts because then that 11 o'clock would have been one o'clock in the morning. But low hanging fruit, I squeezed in my core session for my home workout. And because I struggled to do that for some reason, I just took that as a win for the day. A couple of jog jogs with regs at Rex and a core workout. So yeah, super busy, but super pleased to get that core workout done. Friday morning though, Friday feels like my Saturday because the podcast's out. I can... Sigh, breather, sigh of relief. Six times one K on the treadmill, which is not a huge session on paper, only six kilometers. And I'm trying to remember why I actually did that on the treadmill. Maybe I didn't want to do it on the trails or the pavements again, like the earlier one in the week. Probably, probably shitty weather, but a good session. And the effort and the pace was spot on. And I find it really interesting that my Garmin and the treadmill accurate enough. I think they all pretty much come off, come away with the same distance. So yeah, heart rate and elevation. Fine Saturday sloppy coastal trails with uh, Robbo and Aaron. I really enjoyed that. We were over, goodness me, two and a bit hours were out there. A cheese scone just before our run home. We met up at the lodge. And uh, yeah, when you sit down for half an hour and as a 50-year-old man getting your rusty bones up <laughs> to do that last two, two or three miles home, that is pretty hard. But yeah, a couple of a cheese scone, really good. And this is where you inspired me, actually, because... When you said about your, was it three times 15 minutes, but you just kept going, you wrapped them all in together. <laughs> well, I'd already done two, two work. What would Jason Coop say about that, eh? <laughs> well, yeah, what would he say? I'd already done two workouts. So the, 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 the run on the weekend on the treadmill was, should I do it? Should I not do it? And I listened to the Brew of the Coaches this morning for this week's show. 
And I think Trish said the athlete we were talking about, she was in her 50s. And Trish said maybe about maybe doing one workout a week. And I'm thinking, oh goodness me, I did three workouts a week. Um am I like literally too close to the line here of, of, mm. of injury or, or overtraining? But anyway, I thought, well, I'll do 20 minutes of this threshold run. Yeah, I just stayed on there and went for the full 30 heart rate in that zone four smack back in the middle. It did drift up a bit. I felt really awesome after this run because I, I think I've said a few times, I'm not even too sure if I could do a sub 20 minute 5k at the moment. But this was 5k pace for 30 minutes and I didn't come off there and collapse in a heap. So I think... I could. It's a, it's a manufactured, the thing with the treadmill, it's a manufactured environment. There's no resistance. There's no slightly going uphill or there's no downhills. You don't get a, a tailwind, you know, so everything is pretty consistent. So it's hard to see how it translates into re- reality. But to hold that pace for 30 minutes, I think, I think I could do a sub 20 minutes. Uh, but yeah, the reason, partly the re- my ego, partly the reason why I stayed on for the full 30 minutes because the guy who owns the gym, I, I'm, I think I'm a bit of an, an anomaly in the gym because... I'm the only one who actually rinses themselves on the treadmill. Yeah, people just go on the treadmill at mine just to like basically warm up or walk. Yeah, there probably is other people who do it, but not that I've seen. So I'm the one there doing three times 15 minutes on a 15 incline or 30 minutes at about 6.20s on the treadmill. And he was like, wow, you're a machine. How long have you got left? And I'm like... Oh God, it was going to be over now, but now, now he's asked me. Oh, oh, three hours. <laughs> so yeah, that's partly why I did the remaining 10 minutes a minute, a 30 minute threshold run. This is, I suppose, partly why I was really happy with the way the workout went, because although the heart rate did drift towards the end, it didn't drift into what I think my zone five is. The chasm, so that, the chasm yeah. of death. <laughs> so that effort was, so for it to stay like was pretty much smack bang in the middle of zone four, after the 30 minutes, I was, I think that effort per duration is correct. We had a momentous moment in the Thwaites household. My youngest child, George, he's finally the tallest person in the Is Thwaites that hard household. to be in your household, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> a mighty five foot six. I think he's five foot seven now. He's, yeah, he's a good inch, good inch taller than me. I it meant a lot to George, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's nothing big, but yeah, I could see by his face. He really, he was buzzing. Yeah, we just made it like a throwaway comment when we went to see my dad on Sunday. I think, oh, I think you're taller than me, George. We went back to back and he's got a lot more hair. He's got hair. So that's more hair than what I have. So we officially measured ourselves on I uh, find Sunday. it so strange that I look into the eyes of my child now. I'm like, this is so strange that we stand here and you are eye level He's exactly yeah. the same height as me. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm still zipping you up in your little sleeping bag and putting you in your cot <laughs> after lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And suddenly you're like, oh, you're suddenly. And yeah, I know before you know it, he'll be taller than me too. And then he'll just be putting his arm around me. I know as he does already and going, oh, mum. Well, as you walk oh, around the house, mom. you'll just see photographs of when they were five and six. And now they're not. They're 15 and 17 and deep voices. Well, Esme's not got a deep <laughs> voice, George has. <laughs> but I'm also, what else is <laughs> Also doing a Suntour race review. Get that correct. And I do feel like I'm cheating on my Garmin a bit, my Garmin Phoenix. Uh, I'm a massive, goodness me, I've never strayed off the Garmin path. So it's quite strange, the Suntour interface. I'm sure it's fine for Sunto users. They are very familiar with it and love it. But for me, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a steep learning curve. And unfortunately, I've got to send this one back, Eddie. It's, it's really annoying. You can't really get involved in it, can you? Because you're like, well, I can't love you too much. You get a bit like a girlfriend that you know is going back to Australia. You're like, I can't, you know, I can't get too involved in this. Can't which commit. one was it that, <laughs> can't commit, which one was it that Jack said he used? Was it the Sunto Jack Verti? Had the vertical, I think I need to be. Oh, the like chorus vertical. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is. I'm enjoying it. The the maps are delicious. Yeah, I'm looking at the maps now because I said to you, I was like, Gary, can I have it for the uh, Northern Traverse? <laughs> Surely you can yeah. keep hold of it for that long and they just won't. I've asked how long I can keep it for and they've not, they've not replied. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it does annoy me because there's two things really. Um, see, if nobody watches this video, then that's a little bit of income that I'm not getting 
Um, so if I need to send it back, I always thought, well, if I keep the product, then it either goes on Patreon, which is awesome for, for, our, for our community, or I can keep it like you see a pair of shoes that you can't really just uh, gift no away. <laughs> so there's some value into the time that I spend doing it. When if I have to send it back, then it's like, oh, actually, is there is there any value in me doing this? If I had 100,000 people view it, then yeah, I'll take back my words. <laughs> but yeah, start off the week. Not good. And I'm still, I, don't, I think I'm not going to talk about food, but I'm still not great with that side of my week. But just under 90 miles of running. Oh my run, God. I know three quality sessions, two strength sessions, two. So yeah, another week you, in the bank. You make me sick. You make you me make sick. Me. <laughs> I just know because the Manchester is really freaking me out because you, I can't. Uh, 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 the ex-chairman of Sedgefield Harriers, when I first started really taking running seriously, he just, he said to me, it's always stuck with me, just, you can't hide in the marathon, Gary. There's nowhere to hide. No, no, not on a road. Trail marathon, yes. <laughs> road <laughs> yes. marathon. Pain, pain. Oh, well, well, it's fine if you just want to jog round, but even when you want to jog round, it's a long way on concrete. But I don't, I don't know what you feel, how you feel. So my ego goal was sub three. The reality of potentially been good for ages 315 would probably to be safe you're looking at maybe three or five three seven do i aim for three or five three seven is that a more sensible thing to do and then if i get into london 2025 do the glory, go for glory, don the mal, sub three. <laughs> I think you have to, because I think if you're going to, you have, you've not gone all in, in this marathon block, you need to, if you are going to go sub three, you've got to be doing just that this vertical climbing on the treadmill is lovely, but it's got to be, it's, you've got to be 5King, you know, you've got to be this speed sessions, the tempo I'm sessions. Faithful to, I know it, it is only just a copy and paste training plan from Garmin, but I, the, the sessions... I've not straight, I've not done any other sessions. So these hill sessions are sessions that I would... That At 15%. Well, they just say hill, so... Yes, yes. So there's a big difference, isn't there? And True. also the long run, the long run, the key long run, when you start putting marathon, you know... It didn't say a sloppy a course. Of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Well, this week's, yeah, we're not going to talk about this week's, but yeah, there's some marathon-paced effort. In, but that's not going to happen. We ran Annecy Marathon a few years ago. P P pre podcast when we were able to just live our lives happily without showing it to thousands of people. We ran Annecy Marathon, which is in April, I think, and we did a lot of. He did not enjoy it. No, he enjoyed the marathon. He absolutely caned my ass in the first half. He awesome. we wanted to run three hours, and he went through in one th one twenty eight, I think. Whoa! Um, wow, he went off hard. I couldn't give up with him when he went off. We went off so fast. Anyway, um, but we, yeah, what we struggled with, I think we did it in 3.08 or something in the end, but we struggled because we hadn't, the last bit, we just hadn't done those long runs, 20 mile with the marathon pace at the end. Yeah, yeah. He just like, he did like, I just enjoyed because I was about two minutes behind him at halfway and then I just ate him up like a Pac-Man. Um, I didn't have a very good run, but I definitely, he, we were like, you've got to do those longer. That We did like 18 miles, but we did loads of it on the treadmill. Why we did it, I don't know. I think we were just... We were I might like, have to swap out a session this week because talk about, well, the run that I'm doing the weekend is a long run in the lakes. Obviously, but the on the plan it is X amount of time with I think how many weeks now? It must be what eight weeks? No, ten nine, weeks. Nine nine weeks. Probably he's still I got a little bit. I probably yeah, he's still got a little bit. It's very hard. No, but as you said, I think framing it going three oh between three oh five, three oh eight, that you can do you could probably it's a huge do. difference. It's, it's a huge it's a difference. Huge difference. We were I don't know what we were thinking, thinking we were gonna do sub three off hiking around mountains um <laughs> but don't worry again don't worry about it like we said last week if it was just a run out because i've got this london goal nobody cares gary nobody cares i i care you oh, care I, I, you care but you don't care enough to not go to the lakes <laughs> well this, yeah this is it god yeah this is what i have to have <laughs> this is an exactly a client call when my client goes no but i really want it i'm like if you really wanted that you did and they're like yeah 
Be yeah. realistic. Be realistic. Are you doing amazing, Gary? You're doing amazing. So yeah. shut up. I'm shut amazing. Up. You're right. Let's go to brew with the coaches. They're much more amazing than us. But this week, the coaches help Patreon Tara Wood. And she's training for a 50k. This week's question comes from Tara Wood. I've just started a 16-week training program for a 50K in March, and there is a lot of back-to-back -back running in it. I've usually avoided running consecutively in fear of injury, but now I'm wondering if this is actually a key part of training, running on tired legs, or can I swap that second run session for a bike session? Advice, please. P.S. I'm soon to be 50 and now on HRT, if that makes any difference. Thanks, Tara. Yeah, we were a bit confused, actually. Is this... Like back to back long runs, maybe at the weekend or just back to back days throughout the week. So, yeah, hopefully we answer it correctly. But, yeah, first over to you, Trish, what do you think? I'm reading it as you're just doing consecutive days of running now in your normal training program. So, what I would say is it, there's a couple of things. So, firstly, have you had injury previously? So, if you have had injury previously and it was due to, for example, increasing load, then by increasing your running, you definitely do want to be keeping an eye on that because of your age as well. So as we get older, we definitely want to be getting stronger as well and doing more strength and um, and conditioning stuff. As you get older, that's one of the key things you can do and should be doing. I would definitely recommend that in terms of that would stave off a lot of a lot of the injury issues there. The other the other thing to, to remember as well is actually what effort level of your running. So, you know, are you doing a big chunk of your training at an easy level or for example are your consecutive days for example a hard day followed by another hard day or a hard day followed by an easy day for example it's really difficult to give advice on that without actually seeing your plan but generally you don't want to be doing back-to-back -back hard days okay um your the vast majority of your plan should be easy running uh, and you do want some hard stuff in there but again looking at your age as well it it's uh, i would say probably one hard session as uh, as a max per week and this is just generally i would say as a as a as a coach but again it depends for you individually um and you know that next day for example that might be a good day to put in a bike session as opposed to a running session there are are so many fantastic female runners that do fan fantastically well at ultra running who do a huge amount of time on a watt bike you know so you can definitely build up the base that you need for that if you're going to do a 50k it depends on again if you just want to complete or whatever you do need to be training you do need to be doing run specific training keep that in mind don't swap too many out uh, with bike sessions ultimately you want to run and not and not not bike it but bike Bike is a definite good go-to in terms of increasing your endurance, your aerobic capacity, but also your VO2 max as well if you if you get some of the sessions right. But my my key takeaway would be look at strength and conditioning for um, the injury stuff if you're worried about that because you definitely should be doing it. Uh, if you're increasing your running program, it's pretty normal to be running most days, I would say. But again, it depends on what your load is. So, you know, for example, I run six days a week and when I'm in a, tr a like a high training period, um, some of those will be double days. Russell, for example, will might do double days most days to get the mileage in that he requires, depending on your training and your time, for example. So maybe look at that. Maybe also look at the fact that there's a lot of evidence now, particularly for older women, that doing double runs per day, for example, shortening the amount of time that you spend on those runs, but doing double a day, that can actually be more beneficial. So there's lots of different ways to look at it. But generally, I would say strength and conditioning, for sure, get, get going with that. You can swap um, runs for bike stuff, but again, it totally depends on what's going on with your plan. So ultimately, you do need to, if you're going to be running, you're going to you're going to have to do some run training for that. Always start with a plan that you can come in with at the right level as well. So if the plan is asking you to do four, five uh, runs a week and you're currently on two, three, it might not be the best plan for you. Don't fit the plan to you. You fit the plan. Take a look at it. Take the bit. Be more like Gary. Look at the plan. Take the bits you like out of it and then <laughs> change it to fit with you. Have I do we... like that though. I remember the first if I was I heard somewhere, if you look at that plan and it's like the first two weeks are like 
holy smoke that is super scary then that probably might not be the right plan for you but what about i was wondering if it is because i took the back-to-back as big long days double days at the weekend what about if that was basically where the what the question was alluding to i've done them in the past and i'm not too sure physically at the benefits but from a mindset point of view i did come away from them feeling pretty good but yeah from a physical training point of view especially maybe for a 50k is there much value in that what do you what do you think i would say for a 50k you don't need to do back to back running it's the, you just, you've got to weigh up like yes back-to-back running is actually great if you're thinking of a multi-day i i give them to more experienced athletes but people towing ultras for the first time let's just build that let's just get a good long run and not and recover the next day because it's the recovery that makes you fitter so if it is about back-to-back running especially for a 50k focus on just having a really good quality long run rather than the next day because that is when the damage will be done rebecca what do you think uh she says she's 50 and she's on hrt now what difference does taking hrt make to your ability to train does it does it give you superpowers? It's hopefully helping to limit anything like bone thinning and bone mineral density loss that you that you can have um, as you pass through sort of menopause and your estrogen levels drop. So keeping your estrogen stronger keeps you in that sort of premenopausal hormonal state. So hopefully it's avoiding that sort of injury risk. So bones and, and muscles and, and joints and tendons, all those things hopefully are, are less at, at risk. In terms of how you sort of make sure that that is the case is as Trish says adding in strength work is, is a minimum is is the thing that I would certainly look to add in to for anybody who's increasing their mileage at whatever age but certainly as you get older just because we know the importance of strength work just for longevity in general let alone sort of athletic performance um so yeah HRT hopefully is helping get rid of any symptoms it's getting rid of that sleep disturbance all of that sort of thing which can have a detrimental effect on your training so certainly by being able to sleep better making sure your body is sort of physically not at risk of the low estrogen levels that will be all positive but it's not a substitute for also doing then the training and the strength work on top should we all be on hrt then in our 40s as women it's really difficult to know that isn't it it's becoming like obviously something we're much more aware of and anyone who's got symptoms um is encouraged to obviously uh, go and have a have that discussion um in that perimenopausal period rather than waiting till everything has sort of stopped and, and, oh, and uh, afterwards yeah so i think earlier um it is becoming more uh, more pr- you know, common that people will seek out treatment and advice earlier on. So if people do feel they've got any um, menopausal type symptoms or anything like that, then it's really important to go and discuss that, particularly if that coincides with a time that you're trying to train for something you've maybe not done before. Um, So certainly making sure those symptoms are treated, particularly, as I say, the sleep is a really important thing. If you're not sleeping well uh, because of menopausal hot flushes, that's just going to be detrimental to training. So all of those things. And it's a massive, so many women are now stepping into the ultra uh, scene but later on in life as the kids yeah. perhaps the kids are a bit older and they suddenly find they've got a bit of time on the weekends back or they suddenly realize they want a bit of time back but then they're the age also when the body sadly starts to decline and they're mm. facing a bit of a battle so you have to be so cautious if you are of that age i guess with your and with your plan building up and so i think tara's being really wise questioning mm. the back to the, i would say back to, if you've not got a history of running and you're coming into this quite new coming into ultra running i would say cross training and strength work should be almost half your plan really and the running will be there for your first ultra and then you, you can slowly change the scales a little bit as everything gets a bit stronger and you learn um and you move forward the only other thing i would add to that would be um the volume um oh lord 100 miles <laughs> is it, yeah, 100 miles a week tara <laughs> off you go um, no no um is um if you have a a volume for the week i don't know how the um training plan is structured but people forget the levers that they have still at their disposal and pace is a really big one if you're running every other day i I can't figure it out, but I think that means three runs a week. So there is going to be a limited amount of running specific growth in lots of ways that you're going to be able to get running three times a week. And that's fine when you're starting out, like you guys said, but um, you could consider going out for a walk on your non-run day. And that walk can be quite 
well, challenging and certainly beneficial. A really good way to gauge it is just by your breathing. And if you have a run buddy, is if, if you can talk to that person while you're doing this walk. And if you can't, then you're probably pushing too hard. If you build that into your schedule, then you might find, yeah, after your next race, you get to a point where that walk can become an easy run. And so you've built it in really, really carefully and gradually. And so your body isn't shocked and the injury isn't likely to crop up out of nowhere. So that would be something um, I often um, send my athletes a video that I found of Kenyan athletes going out for their easy run at six in the morning because people can't believe how slowly they run. And there's still benefit there. There's still immense benefits there. So sometimes just understanding that that pace lever, you can pull that right, right down run really easy or walk and still get massive benefits from that i love it there if you have a run buddy it's just a self-regulator isn't it you just uh if you can't have a conversation then it's not easy simple as that until yeah. one of you starts to push the pace <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> good luck clara looking forward to your photo on the All facebook right. group of you finishing with your goodies whatever you get at the finish line keep us posted how you get on team trail snood wild way en route that's what we want to see in the Facebook group. It's basically a tick box of things to complete <laughs> now. <laughs> Hope training is going well, Tara. Let us know. Pop something over on Facebook and good luck with your race. Thanks as ever to our delicious coaches. Love you all. This week's guest is Lucy Gossage. What... An inspiration, oncologist, former pro triathlete, move against cancer, co-founder and winter spine race podium finisher. That's a mic drop moment. Hope you enjoy our chat with Lucy Gossage. Today we are joined by Lucy Gossage, fresh or raw from the 2224 Winter Spine Race, podium finisher, Instagram sensation two, kudos from everyone at T and Trails. It's a couple of weeks out, but yeah, you're still a bit broken, still famished and not enough at every opportunity. Physically, I'm doing all right, actually. Better than I thought. I wasn't, I didn't know what to expect, to be fair, with the whole recovery malarkey. Yeah, physically, like no aches and pain. I mean, I was going so slowly at the end that I think that was like recovery for the tendons <laughs> and muscle. And I was catching up on sleep as I was going, so... Um, yeah, physically better than I expected. And how was your body though when you peeled off multiple layers? How were your feet, that kind of thing? Chaffing, we mentioned chaffing every week on this podcast. It's a common theme. But yeah, how did your body hold up? My feet were 10 out of 10. Um, like I had niggles at the start. Like I got quad doms and um, a few little niggles. And then by day three, start of day three, they were all gone. I was swollen. I wish I'd weighed myself. Like I did put a picture on Instagram. I was, I mean, my legs looked like old lady legs of someone with heart failure. <laughs> Um, and I was, I mean, I think I beat your puffiness, Eddie. I, was, I thought we like, could have been twins at that finish. Rich Chinese rich. twins. <laughs> Yeah, so well, yeah, I so I was I was pretty swollen, but um it went down really quickly actually, even over the 24 hours it was kind of starting to look at. I was like, oh, I've got eyes again. <laughs> but my feet were amazing. I didn't I, I didn't get any bliss. I mean I I went for hokers, which were just so comfortable. And actually in the ice they were the perfect shoes because you didn't yeah. even need the, the muddy grip. Yeah, I never got blisters in all the training that I'd done with them. So I would have been a bit gutted if I had some got blisters. Got a, a dodgy toenail, you know when you bang your toes. Yeah. But other than that, yeah, I've come out physically pretty well from it, I think. I'm not too sure if it's one of our questions, Eddie, but yeah, I'm just really curious now, what was your sock but strategy, if no blisters, people are going to dine to know this. Yeah, so I did quite a lot of research. I went for the Ninja Toes and the compression deck shells, which oh, ran yeah. out like they they ran out of stock like in October or November when I was buying all the kits. So then I bought like backup. I mean, it's blaming expensive. Anyone who says ultra running is just get out and run. <laughs> <laughs> it's nonsense. Yeah. I've spent I mean, so much money on kit, like thousands of pounds. You, you know, you need six pairs of socks and each pair of socks mm. is 40 quid. That's 250 quid on socks just to get Ooh. around the race. But yeah, good combo, yeah. Ninja Toe socks and um, compression deck shell mother. 
So, and I saw on your Instagram picture, so I learned when I'd done it, in, and I should have messaged you to cut the elastic at the top of your compression socks, because uh, when your legs swell, they'd obviously yeah really attractive yeah yeah and actually I got because I had a spare I took a spare watch in case my watch died so I had that carried on my other arm and then that got my arm must have swelled so I had then had scabs all around my arm where that was cutting into it it's only the stuff you get but yeah ligaments and tendons and things I've just kind of come out unscathed as far as I know I haven't done anything to test it but I feel like I've come out unscathed what about trench foot and stuff like that we, we I use a trench foot cream in the past that seemed to do quite well I did use that there were all these tips that I get on podcasts it was it was interesting because there's a traffic like I guess I got used to doing these podcasts I was like god there's so many people saying the same thing again 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 and then when I got into like trail running and ultra running I was like where's the podcast like where can I let oh she mentioned this sock she mentioned this so it was like completely like going back into it. So I did buy the trench foot cream, um, use that kind of in the wet training. I did use it at the start of the race, but it was so it was so cold and dry. I think the only time I got my foot wet was when I ended up on the wrong side of a river and crossed the I had to like I just went across it rather than going back <laughs> and that was that was way over my knees but um yeah and so I did use that but I probably didn't need it isn't that amazing the tagline should be ran the Pennine way did not get wet feet that it was well, so yeah dry. yeah but it was it was so dry so um we had actually done the the le- first leg in a like as a recce and it was chucking it down it was torrential and one of the river crossings I actually put something on the spine race and then took it down I'm so glad I did it it was dangerous like it was it was like mid-thigh with me so mm. fast mm. and I crossed it I was like oh my god this is terrifying and put something on the spine group like I don't think this is safe and then took it down so I thought I just get loads of Jitter. yeah <laughs> um and then i did it again i was like like in the race it was literally just like walking across the <laughs> i was like i would have felt like mike wally saying that was unsafe <laughs> i know i think i know the bit you mean and i think some years when it has been really bad they you've had to cross at where the safety they put a safety team there to help people across they okay, have like yeah. designated crossing points um let's rewind a little bit uh we know you're okay which gary wanted to just check in at the start of the podcast in case you were like, I can't, I'm actually in a wheelchair and I can't walk, but it's, this all sounds positive. Can we rewind a little bit to how you found yourself on the spine? Because most people will know you in a former career as a triathlete. So can you just tell us a little bit about your sporting background? Where, where are you from, Lucy? Where are you from? <laughs> yeah, so I was uh, I was a triathlete, a uh, pro triathlete, uh, quite a long time, actually. Um, called myself an accidental pro because it all started as a drunken dare when a long-term relationship ended. So I entered like Ironman UK as a challenge after that relationship had ended. Um, was a one-off. Kind of realised I actually loved the training. Like I wasn't particularly sporty before then. I started to train a bit better, moved. I'm a doctor, moved from Nottingham where I was doing kind of registrar so seeing patients in oncology to Cambridge to do a PhD hated the PhD didn't have job satisfaction this is like whittling it down to a minute I know I'm listening um, I'm taking it all in she's talking, she's talking. <laughs> because I, I I didn't have kind of that job satisfaction at the time that's when training kind of became a way of validating my days so that's how I started to get good at triathlon eventually I got a very good age grouper I think we crossed paths like your name was familiar so I oh uh, you'd heard of me there. you'd know when you'd see me on the start line I'd be <laughs> finishing a good uh, five hours after you <laughs> no, I, um, uh, your name was familiar anyway so we must have been a, overlapped a bit yes um, and then yeah I, because- knew, I knew of you because friends had trained with you and they'd always been like she's the loveliest person but she's absolutely nuts she can train like a who are these machines. Uh, I can't even remember, but it was mainly boys as well that would go on training camps and like you'd be out in Lanzarote or something and they'd come back broken and they'd be like, <laughs> we need a ride with Goss. Oh my God, she's an animal. I'd be like, I need this woman in my life. She sounds incredible. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I wasn't when I started. Like I was, you know, I was a proper chopper, um, but I did start to gradually get, get better at it when I was doing the PhD and then became a very good age grouper. Eventually decided you know what this is a one and done uh, not one and done once in a lifetime opportunity I don't want to just be winning age group races easily I'll, I'll step up so I was still working full-time got my pro license then um 
won my first 70.3 the day after I'd gone part-time. So I was like, this is so fake. This is working. <laughs> this is, you know, one <laughs> night of being part-time, I went away. Um, but yeah, then I went part-time. And then when I finished the PhD, finally, I had two and a half years, so three seasons of the full-time professional athlete and then went back to work at the end of 2016 to finish my oncology training continued racing professionally for two and a half years something like that and then retired um and then actually was was kind of had a a fun year in 2019 where I was still racing but I wasn't training as a professional so I was you know I was still fit but I I wasn't living my life around triathlon and then it was covid so there was like kind of complete reset and yeah, that's kind of the start, I guess, of these whole adventures. Lucy's being very humble. She did actually win 14 professional Ironman to your yeah. name. So she's making it out like, I just dabbled, I just turned up. And But she was an incredible Ironman athlete. And maybe COVID was quite good in the end that it, it sort of stopped, it kicked the triathlon habit. And then, and maybe with pools shut and stuff, did that, is that when you were like, oh, it's ultra running, what is this? No, you're you're this. so right. So until COVID, I was still I was still swimming like quite a lot, three or four times a week, um, really early mornings with the club. And and I did really enjoy it, but it's a big sacrifice getting up that early. And there was no purpose. It was just, you know, it was something it was what I'd always done and I was just doing it around work. And then COVID came and and after kind of during COVID, after COVID, it was after COVID, I guess I had to really say, do I want to go back to that life or do I, you know, is it actually am I doing it because I've always done it and I'd stopped or am I doing it because I really wanted to? Uh, it's hard to let it go, isn't it? And and now I find when I ride my bike, there's always that bit of like, God, I used to push these watts for five hours. I could struggle for three minutes now. <laughs> but that's why I think like, so I, I guess after COVID, I, I kind of started adventuring. I did silly things with no purpose, like Everest on the bike and kind of longer rides that you'd never do. And um, like not really crazy long ones, just just, yeah, more biking actually. And then, yeah, little by little has kind of evolved towards the craziness of the spine. <laughs> I, it's a good it's a good um, point to jump in with our first Patreon question here because it sort of links to your, to your Ironman background. It's from Ash Harrison and he says, huge, massive congrats on an outstanding performance in what ways did Ironman events prep you mentally and physically for this kind of race and are there any parallels I would say I think I I always thought my like I'm pretty determined what so I to be honest and I'm not I'm not being humble here I think my physical capabilities are by far outweigh my by my determination and I I guess I think in triathlon I overperformed compared to my physical abilities because I worked so hard I was so consistent and and my like my determination I guess was 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 so high so I think that compensated for perhaps not having the biggest VO2 and yeah, I measured it but I, I wouldn't have been in any testing I wouldn't have been exceptional I would have been solid but not exceptional um so I guess that that carries over like the consistency of you know no being able to do things day in day out and I was very consistent with my training yeah I was going to say that I wanted actually not the race because I did before I started the spine I was like Bryn there won't be many people on there that have done multiple on and I am mentally <laughs> and of course it has zero <laughs> and he just looked at me like Woo-hoo! but I looked back on your training for the spine and Lucy is on Strava if any she's I think you post pretty much everything on Strava which I love um and your consistency consistency was so good you trained really smart there's lots of cross training you're always doing your strength training and I wonder actually if that background of Ironman helped you because the multi-sport approach and just the the high volume that you did into the race probably not as high volume as you used to do when you were triathlon but being able to cope with that that just the grind that you need for yeah. training so I think um, like my volume was was nowhere near as much as I used to do as a pro triathlete. Although having said that, when you go and do a 12 hour day kind of talking, that adds up the hours. But if you take out of that, it was basically commuting. But I when when I entered, I the, the non-negotiables where I had to do two strength sessions a week, which I don't like. 
a power yoga with um this crazy friend who does is not yoga it's like proper strength <laughs> really hard so they were like the non-negotiables and I think every single week I look back like for confidence psychology boosting I actually went through my training over the year and I think every week bar two when I was away I did do those two strength sessions and that yoga session um and that's the kind of way my brain works like I'm not you know I set myself rules and and that was they were the things I had to do because I knew that everything else would kind of come along. And the rest of it was like I ran into work and back. Sometimes I'd extend it. Uh, I haven't driven to work for four years. So that kind of was easy. That's a non-negotiable. Tried to keep a bit of biking going. Like early in the year, I was doing much more biking. And then even in the winter, I was trying to just make myself get on the walk bike. Because it's so, when you start running, it's so, so easy. You can just go out and an hour's run, run. And everything else is such a faff, particularly <laughs> in the water. But I knew I'd get injured. So I bought a cross trainer as well, which I used less than I was going to. Because again... <laughs> <laughs> it's just so tedious and I'd always drive get outside but yeah and then the rest was just adventures it was just what I love what I love being out in the hills all day just going and I honestly I, I am so bad you won't believe it but how do you I'm still really bad at running down hills so bad but how do you see me when I started I I'm like Bambi I honestly am <laughs> awful um so I'm not a natural like put me on the flat where you can churn it out I I'm can churn it and I've got pretty good at power hiking up hills but the downhills I'm, I'm so bad so I'm bad. trying to think like the, the so there's the long downhill off Penny Ghent that yeah. I remember that being really icy when we came down that yeah um and then it, it, there isn't a massive ton of downhill is there it seems all uphill <laughs> and I'm way. I can't <laughs> think of any other the first day I was oh there's um, quite a bit off Jacob's ladder you then drop down that was bit. my one of my fears actually 10k there's a, one of the worst descents I think and I was yeah. like, petrified of breaking an ankle down there because the first time I did the Pennine Way I sprained my ankle really badly 2k out of Edel so we haven't even got to Jacob's Ladder and, <laughs> I, and it was just an innocuous so I then like we finished the Pennine Way but I had to tape everything up so I was like got to get to that Jacob's Ladder descent the one you know that really tight yeah I know got to get down that slow as you can because I don't want my race to be over there was a girl called Vicky that I was yo-yoing with in the first day and she ended up pulling up but her tactic it was amazing I wish I could do it she walks and then she bombed the downhills she just bombed them and would put minutes and minutes and it would then take me like an hour and a half to catch up with her <laughs> like what a great tactic just walk yeah but I like... know I think her quads might have paid uh, yeah <laughs> yeah maybe I wonder but... if that was Vicky Savage it's Vicky Savage on the star line I wonder if it was Vicky yeah no it was... wasn't Vicky Savage it was someone else Vicky I'm sure it's Victoria Victoria someone oh yeah uh, there was another Victoria I did yeah, look her up she, she, yeah. she pulled out I think oh. in downhill because I saw it on the road stations but yeah great tactic it's wild, wasn't it? You just see people drift off. I can't, when I'm going down something technical, my feet and my mind, they just don't seem to be able to keep up with each other. But then other people just, yeah, they just go and drift off into the distance. Why the spine, Lucy? What was it about the spine for you? So when I first heard about it, I actually first heard about it on Women's Hour, randomly, I dropped that in, but they were doing it. Women's Hour? You've Jasmine. been on Women's Hour. I'm sure I've heard you on Women's Hour, Lucy. Well, no, so after, ja this is it. Jasmine Paris won, and then a German woman had won this, the transcontinental race. And for some reason, someone had written in about whether it should be Iron Man or Iron Woman. So they got me on to talk about women in endurance sport. And that was when I first heard about the spine, because obviously Jasmine was all over the news with breastfeeding, et cetera. Yeah, I, I listened back before it and I was like talking about this 200 mile quail fell race that seemed bonkers. So that's when I heard about it. And um, I don't want to talk about this, but um, since the spine, my partner, I found out, has been dating someone else. Um, so I don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about but him. Yeah, I was going to ask that you. Actually, do one. That was, it was kind of him that brought it onto my radar and then okay. all the stuff that we did um kind of we did some some cool adventures yeah kind of the more you find out about it the more it scared me and and do you get that thing lucy i do if someone says if you think to yourself i can't do it then my other voice goes well now you have to do it because you think you can't do it <laughs> no it's not that i have to do it it's like can i do it so when i first heard about it and with jasmine i was like that's bonkers and then Kind of didn't really think anything and, and, and it was, yeah, it was always a bucket and I can't not talk about it because it's been part of the spine, like it's been the whole thing, but it was his bucket list race. He wasn't really particularly run sporty. And then 
I think when we did all the adventures, I listened to podcasts and I remember listening to one with Debbie, what's her name? One it Martin Gansani. Yeah. 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 Listening to her talk about it. And and I think that was when it was like the seed was, yeah, I'm going to end up doing this. Cause it kind of moved from being, it's impossible to like, that sounds really horrible, but actually <laughs> quite like the idea of it. <laughs> Goodness me, I've never ever thought that about the spy race. <laughs> I'm more expectation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what i'm trying to not pay that much attention to but what you are like a high functioning <laughs> athlete did you go on the start line were you racing or was it an adventure no 100 percent, it was an adventure um people won't believe it but i didn't ask once about position uh, i didn't look at the tracker once i assumed that nikki spinks had pulled out because i was like why is she not ahead of me <laughs> i knew that i'd seen her coming into checkpoint two when i was coming out my parents were kind of tracking it and, and there was a friend bex who popped up every now and then who was tracking it so i'd see you're not really meant to but she popped up every now and then and not once did anyone they just knew and people find it hard to believe but it wasn't it wasn't a race for me um so I didn't know anything about Hannah's bonus or I think people watching the dots were imagining that I was sprinting to try and beat her. And yeah. I'm bloody glad I wasn't because if I had been <laughs> and then I'd found out about the bonus, I'd have been like, I think you'd have lied down. I was like, I hope she doesn't. Cause what would you have done with that information? Like if someone had said you need to move faster, Lucy, you'd have probably just sat down and gone, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But no, it wasn't it wasn't a race and in the slightest. And I I knew I could do it in seven days. Like I knew I could do 40 miles a day. That would wouldn't have been easy, but I knew that. But I wasn't trying to do it in seven days. I was trying to push myself, but it wasn't to push myself to beat anyone or to finish on a position. It was just to push myself, which I did. <laughs> but it's so sensible because we saw all those men and all they were interested was each other um, mm. and what they were, what position they were going to finish. And of course, it just on the spine, it, you ha- it, 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 the jeopardy of that is just off the scale to not finishing. If you're running, you have got to follow your own journey and not somebody else's and you will end up where you end up. You know, absolutely. Dice will when roll. you, yeah, if you end up in a hole, like you know, it took me twelve hours forty five minutes to do the last twenty six miles. You could be, not going to be six hours. I think, I think, I there. think you and I have got the PW for the people that finish at the top on that last section where Debs was like, "You can do that hut two to the end in like three hours, Eddie." And I think it took me about seven. <laughs> I love hearing that because I think if I was having this, what well, you did have an awesome race, I think I might flip from adventure to racer towards the end. And then, yeah, if the, like you say, the time that you were taking over the last part of the race was uh, super slow in, 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 re- in relation to the rest of the race. Yeah, that might have been, might have took its toll on me, actually, ment- ment- mentally. I think, I mean, I was in such a hole, like... I it, it I mean I'm sure you want to talk about those last 24 hours because it's quite entertaining but um yeah I I didn't even think I'd finished I'd like when I went to sleep in the church I didn't even set an alarm it was like that that my head was so far gone from from even I, yeah I didn't think I was safe to even go up like I was so I was so I mean anyway I'm sure you'll ask about it but no um, no, no. Yeah. it's good when you start when you start thinking about it it's sometimes good to start talking about it because I was watching I was making the kids tea watching your dot like coming over the last bit and I was like every step I was like just envisaging exactly where you were and then when you fit you came across an end they the Facebook live and you hear you you're going yeah. Uh, you were like you were seriously like I and I I just started crying Lucy I was like unbelievably crying and like I was like I I know how she fit like I feel I didn't realize as well how much I was still quite traumatized by the cheviots like when I saw you like all came back to me and I was like oh I just remember the, the terrifying time not knowing where I was keeping falling asleep keeping thinking I was at home where was I why the race had finished and everyone had gone home and it being a the horrible thing and then when I saw you and you finished and I was just like oh my god <laughs> it, it blows my mind though we go to bed we wake up we have our meals and the dots the dots are still moving for days and days and days it's absolutely bonkers that's what made me like because nikki so i had a friend nikki bartlett who was doing my social media um 
I I thought you were doing your Instagram. And so I messaged going, (laughs) Lucy, what are you doing? Like, just don't worry about this now. And she was like, no, it's not Lucy. It's Nikki. Hi, Eddie. I was like, well, I mean, yeah. So she, ironically, she had found out about Andrew during this because anyway, the girl, I mean, I don't care saying it really, but the girl had seen the social media. was like, who's this? girl that Luke, that Andrew's with. Uh, so Nikki knew all of that going through the through the race and Bex her partner knew it all almost anyway. But anyway, she did such an amazing job of like telling the story that everyone at work who like I raced, <laughs> no, I raced pro triathlon for years and no one cared. And then in this I go do some silly little race and they they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And you know, I get back to work and I was like, oh God, when you were off course on that last day, we were like wandering around, and we didn't know what to do. We were all going to find each other and say, what can we do? Like, how can we get back? You see the <laughs> Facebook groups, don't you? They're like, tell her to get back on course. Well, because I didn't have my phone on either. So like people had tried to phone me. <laughs> um, you did maybe, spectacularly go down a ditch or something on that. You were like, you you massively went off. Not it looked massive, of course. It wasn't, it was, but no, you... it was. So I, I was having issues like my Garmin. And Damien Hall had said this in a podcast that his Garmin in the cold was not or didn't work very well. And mine was like it would look like you were on the course, and then five hundred meters down, you'd find you, you were off the course, significantly off. So it was it'd been doing that quite a lot, but but that bit, I, I'd so I was just going along and I was just falling asleep because I was like, as soon as the sun comes up, I nap. And so I'd run along, I'd, I'd gone off course, but I was on the line of my Garmin, 100% on the line of my Garmin. Be like, right, I need to sleep, lie down. And I just fight, face the sun, lie down on the trail, didn't take my bag off, fall asleep. I need to go back and look at Strava and see how much I was asleep for. So I suspect it was quite a long one. And then I'd wake up, I'd go, oh, right, right, go, go, go. <laughs> I would look at the gar- I looked at the Garmin and the Garmin said, turn left. And I, I'd done this bit. I knew full well there was no bit across open moorland. So I don't know what possessed me to just follow the line rather than my brain, which said there's no bit of crossing from Moreland, <laughs> that just kept following it. And then eventually the Garmin catches up and you're like, oh, I'm actually miles off course. So instead of going back, I then like make up. <laughs> I mean, you just make, when you're so tired, you make such bad decisions, don't you? But yeah, that I think that last big sleep, I must look and see how long it was. But um, that kind of sorted me out because I didn't need to sleep again after that. <laughs> How many naps though? I'm, I just don't think I could. I saw loads of pictures of people in churches just hunkered down beside a wall. How many times did you, yeah, take a nap? Oh, hundreds. So I, I would say this, and, and this is the one thing I would say to someone doing the spine. I hadn't appreciated. So I, I like, I just envisaged you'd go to a checkpoint, you'd get a nice bed in a quiet room, and you'll be able to sleep. I guess the spine was set up when it was just the spine, but now you've now got the Challenger North with loads of athletes, and the checkpoints haven't got any bigger. So you've been out. So I had company for the first 36 hours, something like that. No, 30 hours until I got to Halls. Um, and then I was on my own for the entire rest of the race. So you've been out your own for kind of 15 hour chunks, like literally not seeing anyone by the odd, you know support person Sheep. or whatever that's yeah or random person <laughs> cheering you I like Robin Cassidy was in the safety teams so I saw her every now and then oh yeah but yeah and then you get into this checkpoint you're so tired but the the reality is it's chaos so you get a seat and you get your drop bag but there's nowhere to move there's nowhere to sort your kit out you have to sometimes find somewhere to charge it and then if you go and do anything like you go and have a shower or you go to sleep you have to put your checkpoint put your bag away so you have to pack everything up to put it away then you're put in this shared, like shared room with people going in and out and loads of people have this, you know, cough and there's people talking and you're like, right, I've got two hours. I need to sleep for two hours. I have to sleep. I have to sleep. And I just couldn't. And the, <sighs> so I had one good sleep at the checkpoint, third checkpoint. And I think I was in bed for an hour and 10, but I definitely had a full sleep cycle. So I felt good after that. So that was like 48 hours in and then the next in Alston that was when my cough was getting bad so it was like a a really low quality again I probably had a sleep cycle but it was really low quality so with hindsight I should have slept at Hornystead Farm but again bad decisions I saw the lady waving at me and I said she wants you to come in doesn't she I don't want to talk to someone I just (laughs) want to bed (laughs) but um yeah the last checkpoint where is it uh Bellingham yeah like that's uh, that's (gasps) 
this whole bar. It's oh, just, that's you know, awful, really... isn't it? Awful. And again, I let, I went in there to sleep and I knew, I knew I had to sleep because I'd been napping a bit on the way, like, and getting more and more tired and more and more like, I have to sleep. We get in there and then you're stimulated. And then my chest was so bad. I got in there, lay down and had a, it can only be like a full, full it was a full bone asthma attack. I'm not asthmatic, but couldn't breathe, coughing, 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 coughing. Got out, went and saw the medics who gave me an inhaler because I had seen them about my chest before. Tried to lie down again, and and I was just keeping everyone awake. Like I couldn't sleep, and I was keeping everyone awake. So I just have to keep going. There's 60 miles, I can do it because I felt okay. Like you sit down, you eat, you even if you're not sleeping, you rest a bit. So I can do 60 miles, I'll be fine. So I set off to Burnett, thinking I'll be able to sleep there. And the first eight miles were fine. I found out there was a mountain rescue car halfway so I said to them it was really cold probably because I'm moving slower but in my head and tired it was the it was the coldest night so I said do you mind if I get in and just put on my extra layers so they let me do that so because it was too cold to take stuff off to put stuff on if you know yeah and that's when the sleep demons like after that couple of miles after that I was like oh I thought you were gonna say you got in the car and then you were like it's really good in here guys just close my eyes (laughs) I I I should have done I don't know if you're allowed but I should have done but yeah, two miles after that, I was like, I need to sleep. And if I'd just been able to nap, it would have been okay. But I couldn't nap because it's too cold. And I knew that I couldn't just lie down. And it's like, a horrible part of that course with that just like fire track road. With well, loads actually, of tra- it's probably the safest part for what yeah. happened next. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I was like, I just need to sleep, but I couldn't. So I kept going. And then what then this is when it was terrifying. I basically ended up falling asleep and sleepwalking off the path. You can see on my Strava, like I was like, I've not made this up. I'd wake up <laughs> on some side alley or back up the hill that I've just come down, like proper sleepwalking. Um, and it was I can't even describe how scary it was because half of me knew exactly what was going on, and the other half was completely out of control. And I, I remember like trying to, I was like, this is a nightmare about the spine race. I was like, no, it's not. This is the spine race. Is it nightmare? Is it the spine race? Like, is it real? Is it not real? And then I looked at my Garmin, like I could see the red lines going off the purple track. I was like, this is real. I'm actually sleepwalking. It's the most terrifying experience of my life. And then so eventually I got to, because it's like, it's like a dream. You know, those dreams, I don't know if you've ever had them, but. I used to have them with Iron Man where I could only move backwards or I only had one shoe and like you can't get where you want to yeah. go. It's just like that dream, but it was real. It was so scary. And then, yeah, I got to Burness. I saw a head torch. I was like, are you real? No, are you really real? Are you really real? <laughs> the poor people at Burness, they see everybody and they must be like... <laughs> yeah, I know. It must have been super scary though with the asthma attack if you're not asthmatic. I can't imagine that. Yeah, it was. I think... Um, Again, you just kind of get on with it in the spine. I don't think I'd quite realised how bad it was until you look back. But I remember going up Hadrian's Wall kind of, well, going up Crossfell, I had to stop every like five minutes and just lean over my poles. And the only way I can describe it was like effectively like being at 5,000 metres altitude and trying yeah. to, to do something. Um, it was it was just so much harder. The funny thing is it was started on night two. And again, I didn't realise, but I kept hearing these, these sounds like... <laughs> And I, I look out and say, someone's cheering me. I'm like, oh. and then there that was sounds like, like me running. Yeah, I always have like a little whistle sometimes. Oh, uh, yeah. A lower pitched one. And I'd look around like, oh, someone's saying something. <laughs> <laughs> But, but lots of people had it. I like I've never yeah, had, I've had an inhaler it's... once before, but um it never been an issue. Lots of people had similar. I think a lot of people couldn't finish and there was a hell of a lot of people coughing. So it must be something to do with the cold. I think it's the cold, the exposure and the I remember when I got to Greg's hut and like uh, 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 coughing yeah. and the woman was like, Oh, you've already got the spine cough. But and I was like, Oh right, it's this is just normal. Everybody, this is just part of the joy of this race, is it? That we're just gonna cough our lungs and then it took me so long to get over the cheviots it had gone by the time I finished I'd gone through a whole cough cycle question from Neil Robinson he's got a few actually he would like to know I'm not too sure if you can remember this Eddie but the total weight of your spine pack and we alluded to earlier the cost but yeah maybe Neil's thinking about entering the spine race but what's he what's he looking at to spend to buy all the uh, relevant kit oh money a lot so mine was five kilos without any food and water so it was about eight kilos when I left each checkpoint um and that was not quite as light as you could go but 
like I got fairly pretty lightweight stuff. I think then you can get clever about how much water and food. And I think to, I think on the first day, a lot of people cheat and take out half because you get chick kit check the day before. And then you see people on the start line with these tiny packs. So you're like, how the hell? That has not got all your spine kit in. But there's no kit check then until you get to have I see. Break. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you could take it out and then put and it back in. Lots of people do, I'm sure, looking at their packs. Oh, that's like, so dangerous. My goodness, me. <laughs> but yeah, I had, so yeah, mine was five kilos. So I suspect it was eight kilos at the start, at the kind of end of... But there were some things like I was I was not going to compromise on, on spare layers and but if you're going to finish and food like I think the one thing I'd say if anyone's doing it like you need variety of food because you just don't know what you're fancy and what you fancy in training is yeah not I had too much sweet stuff and I always had an expedition meal to kind of heat up which is good that was like a last minute tip someone gave me um because there's loads of places you can get hot water and actually that was so good being able to get proper food and nearly all the kit I used I mean that I was just gonna was say did you use spa. did you use everything I did if I was doing it again I'd get proper gobble, goggles because my goggles were not um they were safety like we bought three quid safety goggles um yeah and like they they were quite hard to see out of when it was snowing but yeah, I use them. I use the Yak Tracks, which are a joke. Like, I wouldn't buy them. They're both pairs broke. Utter nonsense. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, you know I, I would actually use a, tra- a spiked trainer if the conditions were like you were going to do them. I would yeah. do the first 50 in a normal trainer. And then when you go up, um, then when you start heading up into the real Pennine Way, I would just put a spike track because I did the same. I went through two yak tracks and they just broke. And I just ended up flapping around the cheviots with like one yak track. <laughs> no, no, that's a waste of time. That's a waste of time. Yeah. Money. Like I think that's a, yeah, that's really bad on the, the kit list. Mm. But yeah, I used the sleeping stuff, not the booby bag, but um, in the church. And if did I you did, like, it, did you like your jet boil? Uh, no, I didn't actually. But I can see a world where I would have done. Um, so if I did it again, not going to, but if I was if I was taught if I was advising someone, I would say if you struggle with sleep, just plan to bivy outside the checkpoints because then you can just fall asleep when you're tired. You've got all the kit, you've got to carry it, and it's got to be good. At, it's good. At, it has to be good enough to kit to do that. So you could find somewhere sheltered, peace and quiet, sleep on your own terms when you wanted to, with none of this like. Log- and actually, logistically, you'd save so much time because there'd be none of this putting your drop bag away, getting it out again. Oh, in the end, like, did you not? Because I ended up like I didn't bother changing my clothes because I had to kit or do anything. The last few checkpoints, I was like, I cannot put everything back in this bag. I'm just going to lie on the floor and yeah. sleep. <laughs> Next to my bag, <laughs> and I'm not changing. I'm not even. Gonna, I don't even want to take my yeah. shoes off. If you want me to take them off? You can take them off and go to sleep. <laughs> I feel so sorry for the volunteers, though, because like my, I guess I've done a lot of racing, and I, I love the whole experience. And the volunteers are like the loveliest people, and they're doing, they're trying to do the best for you. But it's impossible to, mm. to like there were there were times where there was I was like, well, there's no bed. Um, they were all oh, they weren't there's only just a bed um there were lots of people you can't sleep yet there's no bed available there's nowhere to put you to to sit you down like Alston was there was nowhere to put people and I just I feel like the spine is perhaps erring towards Ironman and and getting too many people for the capacity they've got to deal with yeah I, I guess I, and I, 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 I think we've been unlucky there too because when I got because if you're a female at the front of the field, I always had a dorm to myself because there were they had just women only dorms, and I I never went into a room with another with anyone else. Oh, so, no, I I, but I wonder as well as if the challenger people, um, you were faster at the course than me, so maybe there are more challenges, or also maybe they've increased the numbers and more people are doing it as well. Yeah, I wouldn't suppose if they've got more people doing the challenger. Yeah. That that was kind of left a, a little bit of a bad, just you know, as an experience. Like it wasn't the checkpoints were not nice. Um, I think most people would say that, but the volunteers were incredible and couldn't have been nicer. But I remember saying to quite a lot of them, like, "This must be so hard because you can't even get three people to make them a cup of tea." And <laughs> another question for Neil Robinson. Oh, controversial. I'm glad Neil asked this because I didn't yeah, want it's better. To. It's yeah, better. <laughs> were you? This is Neil's words. Were you gutted 
regarding the third place due to the time bonus given to Hannah? Not at all, because I didn't know. I am, I am, again, I don't want to slag off the spying, but I think they handled it very badly. So I, I I wasn't racing. I wasn't, I, I'd actually, I'd seen a woman in the church leaving whilst I was kind of catatonically trying to get my sleeping bag out. I just assumed that was Hannah. So in my head, she was miles up the road anyway. So on the dots, it would have looked like either I was sprinting to stay ahead of her. It didn't, Lucy. It didn't look like you were sprinting. (laughs) (laughs) Or people, I think a lot of friends would be like, oh, you know, what's happened? It looks like Hannah was sprinting to catch up with you. It didn't look the other way. (laughs) Well, I think, I think, so I think she was. And I think she came in afterwards when we were in the pub and she was kind of not expecting, not knowing how I'd be. And I think I was like, I didn't even know. I didn't even care. But I do, and with hindsight, so what, again, I don't want to moan about the race, but actually, I, I think the spine, there are ways it can improve. So, Firstly, I should have been made aware that Hannah had a mm. bonus and it yes. should have been utterly transparent how that was calculated because actually I was up in the blizzard on my own, lost when the race was being paused and any other woman racing for second or third would have been racing and it would have been a massive thing. I think any other woman, it would have been a massive thing. So I feel like there needs to be utter transparency and that should be communicated. Like with Damien and Jack last year, Damien knew that Jack had a, a penalty and the other thing, when I finished, I mean, anyone who watched saw what a wreck I was. <laughs> I was straight after that interview, carted off on my own, away from away from my friends and family, saying, we need to talk to you about my race, the race. I was like, have I been disqualified? Like, what have I been <gasps> Oh, my God, your and heart then, must have been like... I was like, what? And then sat me down and told me about the, you know, Hannah's bonus. And Hannah did amazing races. There's nothing, you know... Fair play to Hannah. She's absolutely smashed it. But I just feel like if that was my time to appeal or time to, you know, it was not inappropriate yeah. every since. I'd been out there. I was a wreck. Mum and dad had been a wreck. You know, they thought I was dying. Was it your Was it your mummy who had the dry robe on yeah. at the end? So it's like, yeah. oh, she good was like, mom. I was a good old mum. Um, she was, yeah. I, I just feel like that. I should have been allowed to savor my finish for what it was and not, they should, yeah, I just, I just feel like that was really badly handled. Um, and I have emailed and them, but I haven't did, had you, Did yet. you have any, um, did they tell you how they'd calculated the time? No, no. I, I've emailed the spine and I've said all of this. I've said, you know, I had an amazing experience. And again, this is no, Hannah had an amazing race. I'm sure she fully declared, deserved second. But there, there just needs to be transparency about how it's calculated because in the future, going forwards, people are racing, you know, any of the men racing for a podium, it can't just be, and I'm sure it's not perked out of the air, but it needs to be formally shown, lined up with their tracking, like this is where the delay is, this is why we've given it. But, but also it, it, it just opens up too many, um, because you could come off, you could have had a really rough time up on High Cross Nick with your... Um, up on cross foul people could then say oh but i stopped to help this person you know there's there's a lot of jeopardy in the in the thing and uh but but also i do love the i love the ethos of the race that yeah of course it's it is a race but the media attention of it being a race is almost becoming too much because it is a survival challenge as well and it is an adventure and it is dangerous and you if you were up and you ever came across a fellow athlete up there you would never leave them you would never Mm. want to leave it shouldn't be like it shouldn't be all about the positions in some way and yes I get that part of the race but also like Hannah did totally the right thing because you would never leave go past someone Mm. and go keep them oh sorry you are you a woman are you in the spine are you in the full spine right (laughs) (laughs) it's that way um we always you always want to be and you don't want to put people off from ever helping anybody because they do you know what I mean so it needs to be like yeah and I, I did, I, I wanted, you know, I was like, I do, I hope someone's told her before because I've been there and I know what it's like. And, and again, like you said, the finish place, it doesn't matter. The finish is what the spine is yeah, all about at yeah. the end of the day, isn't it? But again, it's just handling this thing, but you handled it so well. You did ha- like what? Well, just you- I literally, it was, it was, it was only kind of processing it the day after. And it wasn't what happened. It was the way it was handled. And I guess it's not what you did. It's what is it? And they say yeah. in friends, it's not what you said. It's the way that you said it. <laughs> did they stop the clock when they paused them at races? So when they paused them at Alston, did you have no? no okay. so, and again, like yeah. So Andrew was caught there, and and again, just no real communication about about what was going on. And it, again, what they do because had they paused it. 
then it's a bit unfair for everyone who's stuck in the blizzard taking hours. Yeah. But have they not paused it, it's quite unfair because they're sat waiting around for two hours. So yeah, it's it's tricky with a a race where it, like you say, it is just really this endurance challenge. So I don't know what the answer is, but I think that clear communication and with everyone that it might affect for bonuses and penalties, particularly mm. in the podium positions or the top 10, utter transparency about how things are calculated. Mm. Those would be my two suggestions for the race. Got another question. Dave Bales, you shared some miles with Dave Oh, Bales. good on Dave. <laughs> Dave, Dave. Dave, now Dave did. He like, he Facebooked us during the race of him doing a wee, which was lovely up on Crossbell. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> we had a cracking few hours. We had a crack. He was a, yeah, he was really good fun. Um, yeah, I felt a bit sorry because he was. I dropped him going into Malham, but it was like suddenly the gap had grown and then I was like, oh, I can't be asked to wait. I'll keep going. But yeah, we had a cracking time. <laughs> Eddie, you need to do a race with Dave Bales. I shared a room with him in London and fleetingly saw him in London Marathon. Lucy's spine shared miles in the spine race with him. You need to hook. I wonder if you're doing the Northern Traverse. Well, Dave would like to know because he said you made it look so easy uh, moving over that frosty ground. What was your, you said about you were faithful to your two strength sessions a week yeah what give people a little idea what your routine was so we did a hell of a lot of point to points um so multi-day so we'd done um over the last year we'd done the coast to coast we did uh, which is a northern traverse route so we did that over five days we did offers dyke we did the dragon's back route um not part of the race but we did the route um Whoa. so we tried that actually two years ago and I tore my quad uh coming down Snowden in the first day so then we did we had to change the route we did cross Wales in six days but I that was on the mountains so I couldn't run any downhill oh sorry Lucy how did you so you'd day one there's only one day I remember actually physically a pub being nearby some civilization so did you have to finish the day and then kind of run to somewhere where you could stay the night a, li- a little bit so um bed geller is where we stayed the first time. and that first time was oh my god it was so hard because because it just it's so difficult technical and it took so much longer than we expected so we missed dinner the first night then it was this exponential spiral of waiting for breakfast to open so that we could get breakfast and then buy oh. food and it was second night we got in a like after midnight um <gasps> and then it was just this, oh. it was so it sounds harder than the dragon's back i don't want to do was, recipes with you lucy it doesn't sound like you <laughs> we had one hot meal on day halfway through day four was the first hot meal that we had this is terrible planning. I like, I always like, I'm just booking our recce for Northern Traverse. And I, I, first thing I do is check where the hot breakfast is coming from at the B&B. Well, this, this, this year, this year I was like, when I, don't, I I've always finished a race and, and that had bugged me. It wasn't a race, obviously, but it really bugged me that I couldn't do it. So I'd, I'd got a little bit of leave, like accumulated. So I was like, well, I'm going to do it again. And then Andrew decided he'd come, but um, he was injured going into it. So long story short, um, he he ended up doing kind of the easy route from day three. So I I finished that on my own. But anyway, we'd done that. Like that was really tough, but um, yeah, nailed it the second time. Quite, I think the self supportive stuff is it to some, people think it's easier than a race, but I think it's it to some extent it's harder because you have to carry your stuff, but also the logistics of yeah. sourcing food and finding out where to to stay. Um, you know, the, the food is the main thing. Anyway, yeah, we'd done that. We'd done the Pennine Way in two stages. So I'd done all those point to points. Um, and then I started using the pack in end of September, I think, once I recovered from the Dragon's Back. Got my pack and started going out and doing days with that. And I, I think, I know lots of people say you don't need to. I 100% think you need to. Like it's, particularly as a woman, like the weight is much more proportionate. We could get onto the spine about that too, saying actually so it's scientifically proven that it over five percent of your body weight affects your biomechanics. So women should be allowed to carry less weight or men carry more to make yeah. it more even. Just give them some rocks because you want us get to a have a five percent time bonus. <laughs> yeah if anyone was doing it i would 100 percent. so i did a i did a long day every single week bar one i think until i tapered with the with the bag and the long days were sometimes just hiking um sometimes i call it jorking where you i mean you you, you jog and you walk and yeah it never average more than four miles an hour most of the time it's less than that um but there'd be long days like 50 60 k's but they were just fun so and then other than that getting to him from work the odd swift bit of yes trying to ride once a week annie asks lucy we've touched a bit on the kit well we've whined about it a bit <laughs> uh do you have a fa- did you have a favorite bit of kit maybe a jacket a holes, layer holes. 
Polls. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I love my polls. I discovered them this year. And they're amazing. They're like, I'm such a heavy poll user. Like, I sometimes think I use my arms more than my legs. <laughs> what was your poll of choice? Uh, oh, God, I don't know. Some quite heavy ones, actually. I had some some lightweight, lucky ones that I was using in the summers. But um, I was like, I need ones that are not going to break. I need, I don't mm. care how heavy they are. Mm. I need mm. I need strong ones. With, um, I can't remember. I and mean, they're not ridiculously heavy, but they're like foldable away ones. They, yeah. Did Once you got them out, did you keep them out? I use a stop from mile one all the way on. Yeah. They were out yeah. from mile one. <laughs> yeah. I'm being did it mess up your did it mess up your eating at all though? Sometimes with a pole, I seem to struggle to do with the admin because it's a it's a faff. No, you just put them in your other hand, don't you? I think the the gloves. Another thing I would do, um, I would get those, you know, those kids rubber things that you put to tie your gloves onto. I did um, tell you, Lucy. I did tell you that. Did you? It's on it's on the podcast to you <laughs> the wrist things. I should have well if anyone listens to this, do that. It's really yes. annoying putting your gloves away and um, Yes. And then you can swing them. It gives you something to do like when you need this is a sleep deprivation and you take the glove off and then you hit your face with it to wake yourself up. <laughs> Dave Beals also said that you kept shouting something. What was it that you kept shouting? Oh, my, so my niece, who's six, she phoned me out one day. She's like, she's, Lucy, when you're running, if you're tired, do you think if you say super boost, that will make you go faster? Will make you less tired? And I was like, I don't know, Rosie, I'll try. And I was running, actually, <laughs> doing a, a like, long run commute. So I, <laughs> and I phoned her back and I was like, Rosie, I think it does work if you say it. I think it works really well. If you shout it. <laughs> and I told Dave this. Like, try it, Dave. Because honestly, you can't shout super boost at the top of your voice and not feel like you've got a boost. So it works it's like really a big well. power up. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I love it. Joe White, what sleep Gremmel's hallucinations deja vu do you experience and how did you handle it? So I quite like the hallucinations on, I've never had them before. Yeah. I actually quite like them on night two. So I was getting those like auditory ones, which is actually my wheeze, which I was imagining people. <laughs> but then I kept seeing, I kept seeing people. And one stage I saw the guys that I've been running with into whores. And I was like, why are they hiding behind the hay bells? And then I was like, thanks for the hay bell. So then I kept seeing tents because I was like, I really need to have a lie down. I need to have a lie down. I'd, I'd see these tents. So yeah, people was nothing. Was nothing scary. No, no, just um, no, nothing like that. Other than the, the sleepwalking. Which yeah, was, yeah. It, it's weird when you can't tell what's because I remember seeing Robin Cassidy in Middleton, and it was like five o'clock in the morning, so uh, early morning. I hadn't got light yet. It must have been about five. And I remember seeing her and someone else because they were on the safety team. And like I'd been seeing all these lights, and I was like, these really look like real people. These, re- I'm, I'm sure that's a real person. <laughs> and then it was Robin. I was like, <laughs> how many people do you think go up when the safety team appear at that like between three and five a.m. and then they go? Everyone must go, are you real? Are you real? <laughs> they must get a bit of a complex. <laughs> These people yeah. are nuts. Yeah. I quite liked it there. Like, I've never taken drugs. My brother used to do quite a lot. And I, I said to him, I think I know what it's like now to be on being drugs. Like kind of heightened yeah. awareness of it. I mean, at, until the sleepwalking, like that, it was kind of quite nice. Um, yeah. If you did it again, would you would you sleep more? Or would you just, as you did, like, just suck it up and just try and get to the finish? No, like, I raced it so stupidly. But but my race wasn't, I wasn't trying not to sleep. It was that I couldn't sleep. Because you've had no sleep, the drive just becomes to finish so that you're in a cycle of, like, I need to sleep. But you're like, but I, but if I get to the finish, then I can sleep. So yeah. it, like, becomes a messed up message in your brain, doesn't it? I bet there's a bit of psychology you could do about being able to sleep. Um, but I think I would I think I would plan not to sleep in the checkpoints. If they unless they do something about the checkpoints to make them quieter and more spacious. I think I would plan to use the checkpoints to go in to get food, to change your socks, maybe have a shower if you want a shower, but then get out and sleep on my own in a ditch, which sounds crazy, but actually that you can get a good night a good night, a good two hours sleep in a ditch on your own would have been perfect. Did you go into the toilets at Dufton just before Hadrian's Wall? I know, at Greenhead. Is it Greenhead? Is it Greenhead? Yeah, yeah. Really? Greenhead that at was, Dufton. That was amazing. So I'd been on my own all the way from Alston, and my, that was when my Garmin was really bad. So I was going off course oh, the whole yeah. time. It was, it was taking me hours. 
And I got to just before Green Hen and I was like, you know, I just have a 10 minute nap, lay down just before I got to Hadrian's Wall. And I knew there were some toilets coming. Well, I don't know where they are. Just lie down for 10 minutes, lay down for 10 minutes. And then I saw this, what I thought was a dog walker. And he came over and he's like, oh, I'm a massive fan, Lucy. I was like, <laughs> what? I was like, it's, it's right now. Water to de- any hot water to defrost my bottles because it was so cold. All the bottles like, had completely frozen. So you couldn't even drink anything. And he's like, no, I've got more than hot water. I've got coffee. I've got a fire. Mm -hmm. And they'd got a mini aid station in the toilet in that cafe at Greenhead that I didn't know about. Uh, No, it wasn't there. It wasn't there when I... (laughs) But no, in the hard year when I did it, we didn't. We just had the toilet. <laughs> but I had like... my my best sleep in that toilet. With he did have a flask of hot water. Oh really? Well, no, yeah. they had coffee. They had coffee. They had hot water to make a meal. They had this lovely fire. I was like, "Am I dreaming you?" And he mm. he was so lovely, but just wanted to talk about triathlon. I was like, "Yeah, yeah." Uh. It wasn't really. <laughs> it's such a long slog that Alston to that Greenhead because I remember leaving Alston and it says on the board. 40 miles to the next bit and I was like oh here we go Eddie yeah come on I'll bite oh bye my <laughs> were you on your own for most of the race I was on my own or with these two guys Dave and Leon who just kept I just kept finding random places yeah. it's Eddie again hi it's so tough though isn't it leaving a checkpoint little hundred you've got what seven eight miles 40 miles. Oh, you know, I don't I, think I'd want to leave. So I really enjoyed the first 30 hours. I was with like Dave. There was a guy called Brian that I was with going checkpoint one. And then and the first bit so busy. And then I hooked onto Brian and then he left. And like everyone in checkpoint one was in and out in 10 minutes. Like Nikki Finks and Vicky, like came in after me, gone way before me. I was like, bloody hell, this, this, is, how, this is how they do it. <laughs> yeah. Then I hooked onto Dave and then I got to Malham and I'd planned to have, there's a, a half checkpoint. And I'd be like, right, I'm going to take the full 30 minutes there. But when I got in, there were some guys who were leaving like 15 minutes. And that, so I said, do you mind if I hook up with you? Because I just thought, you know, a bit of company for the next the, the next bit. Yeah, yeah. And actually that was really good. So there were three of them. They'd all done the Northern Traverse together, three or four of them. So they, I kind of ran with them. They kept me going. They dropped me then going into, just on that descent into Hall or the top bit of the Old Cam High Road. Mm. And with hindsight, they, so I then ended up kind of running the whole race ahead of them until the end and they all finished just ahead of me. So I should have done the whole thing with them. Isn't that funny? Because you just get surrounded by like the same five, I saw the same like five guys yeah. the whole time. And, uh, and but you don't see them out on the route. You like see them in checkpoints. They go and you're like, you're only probably about 10 minutes away from them for most of the race. And yet you're I in this I'd like- I actually solitary. got like several hours ahead until my like catastrophe. But um but yeah, they're all really experienced. And and it's, yeah, that bit, I really like those hooking up with random people. But I, I would say actually, because it wasn't a race, I wasn't doing it to do as quickly as possible as in racing people. I actually did really enjoy being on my own. And I think that's one of the special occasions that it's hard to describe, isn't it? When you're on your own for so long with just seeing, you know, Bex would pop up like once a day and I'd see her randomly. She'd be like, hi. <laughs> um, and then you know you'd see various people out there cheers and things but you're just on your own and I I like I downloaded hours of podcasts and music and I I didn't listen to a single podcast I just kind of was in my head which is it's such a unique experience that I don't think you can get in any other aspect of life really I think it was one of the biggest things I enjoyed and I've sort of been searching for it since is that wow being and it's something that if you you have to be prepared for if you're going to do the race being on your own being in your own company it's a treat I think it was a treat I love it it's a treat really Gary are you okay with yourself I think you've got a few demons (laughs) in there haven't you (laughs) (laughs) no because life is so busy and to have a a week of just you and your own thoughts just doing what you love doing yeah it's it's a it's a privilege no phone like that's why i didn't want to use my phone for anyone because i i didn't realize quite how much support there'd be but i knew it would be going mental and you know all my friends would be and i just like i don't you know i just don't want to look at anything because i don't want to get distracted and um that's quite special to have literally nothing you know no no yeah from the outside world can we just touch a little bit on 
nutrition, Lucy? Did you have a nutrition plan going in? No, they didn't have a plan, but in all the points points, I've just done really well with normal food. And again, I guess knowing I think knowing the checkpoints, you kind of know what you can get, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it would make it much easier another time. Yeah, I struggled more than I thought I would with food. Kind of had a lot of sweet stuff that I was taking, which I didn't really fancy. I think like you, because it was so cold, everything's frozen. So trying to eat frozen waffles and frozen you know nothing's appetizing yeah the water bottles kept freezing so it's really hard to drink enough I, even though it's cold you still need still need to drink and i suspect i underfueled massively without trying to because also the checkpoints are so busy but i didn't i wasn't even having massive feeds that compared to what i eat normally like i would normally eat like i'm easily a four thousand calorie a day person like i eat a lot and they'd give you like this tiny little bit of lasagna and then you'd have to ask for more. But it was so busy to try and get more. You're kind of like, do you know, I can't be bothered. I can't. I didn't even know they had puddings. I was like, just just get me to somewhere to sleep. But Lucy's then... had like, she didn't have you at Middleton, did she? Because No, I would have took care make... of you, Lucy. You made me special. I had, <laughs> I had special sandwiches. I had... I'm sure they would have done, but it was just so busy. Like they, they could not have been nicer, the volunteers, but yeah. there were so many people. They were, I felt like it was a bit like me trying to do a good service in an oncology clinic in the NHS when no matter how hard you're trying and how nice you are, it's impossible to do a good service because it's just so busy. I never use gels, but I'd probably take more gels, more energy drink, just because when you, when you are not kind of struggling, when you are struggling a bit, um, it's easier yeah but it's so hard I remember that like even like by the time you get to like checkpoint you're you're two three days in I was watching like people making up energy drinks in their bottles and I was like oh I forgot to put my my energy drink in the bottle last checkpoint so I like it just the mind just like goes doesn't it so you don't even know when you last ate you don't even know that you're hungry because um, you just don't even really feel hungry yeah that's you're just... the thing so I think like as an as a novice I learned I would probably set an alarm because again, I, I would have, I'm normally so good at eating. Like I just don't have an issue. I've, it's an all the free triathlon through all the points, points. It's never been an issue. But with this, I bet there were times where it was three hours and I didn't have anything to eat. So. Oh, easily. Because if you think as well, like when you're doing the big climbs or yeah. through the night, like it's just, the, it's just so hard to get the calories in. And yeah, I think I d gels are hard, aren't they? Because they don't, three four days of gels again no I think I'd just have them as an emergency when you kind of really don't fancy anything but also because when it's cold like the whole faff of getting stuff out it's like you have to take your gloves off you have to get cold hands you have to open stuff then it's like rock hard to, I mean it's proper, it sounds proper whinging but it's a if you're thinking about doing it it's logistically all that stuff that is so much harder than you realize you need a company to come out with some sort of hot thick soup that will stay hot <laughs> yeah. you know, like the hand warmers so i use the hand yeah, warmers that's, they were a game really... changer so you get them out like a, a sachet that you open to its cold air and somehow it becomes hot <laughs> that's what you need <laughs> lucy you've had a um just over a, a week just over a week now to reflect um highs highs lows lows what was your highest point and what was your lowest point on the race highest point like I love that feeling on the start line I, I'm so nervous I, I, like, I haven't been that nervous for such a long time because it just um, felt impossible it felt so ridiculous but actually that's what I'm really proud of that's what I loved sunrise like I, at hall sunset even like, so I couldn't sleep at halls I'd got there way quicker than I thought and ended up leaving there at three so I had this amazing sunset on Shenafel and I actually recorded oh. a video which I sent to Nikki but didn't send and I was like Oh my God, I'm so nervous about the night. This is the unknown. This is what I've been kind of doing it for. I don't know what's going to happen. I haven't slept, but look at this sunset. And it was just like ice. And that was like a proper high. The low was the sleepwalking, obviously, um, which again, with hindsight, actually, I suspect, you know, there's a bit of me. I like, am I annoyed that I was so close to doing a really good race? and messed it up or actually I wasn't doing it as a race I was doing it to, to push myself and and you know I did dig that hole and I just about by the skin of my teeth clambered out of it um you've got more stories think, as well Lucy yeah with all those stories so yeah I think that that last bit was a low um 
yeah and then coming in to to get Yetham um that was how, yeah. how did it feel when you hit that bit of road and you, you know, know you're this pretty- is awful um <laughs> So there was a, a random guy who wasn't doing the race who'd met my dad in a pub. He's lovely, absolutely lovely. But he'd taken a photo with me at the top and he was going up to the Cheviot and he said, oh, I'll, I'll catch you up on the way down. Um, lovely guy. But he caught me up for that Marbita road and he was just yakking at me. And I'd always, he was lovely. Like, oh, you might listen. So no, he was absolutely lovely. Um, but I'd when we'd done the recce, Oh, it makes you sad because obviously we've done it all together, me and Andrew. But anyway, there's this bench, isn't there? One K from the finish. And I'd always said, I'm just going to sit there and have a reflection. And I like started welling up and he was talking to me about something. And I was just, I just want to be in my own head here. <laughs> but yeah, kind of getting there and then just like sobbing and sobbing and sobbing on mum and dad. The enormity of of kind of going through those lows, isn't it? And coming out the other way. And that's kind of, I, yeah, I think, Signing up to something that scares you so much, that's that's the reward for it. And that's why I think, you know, it's so good to do stuff that puts you so far out of your comfort zone every now and then. Nicola Dawson says, what advice would you give to anyone thinking about taking on this momentous challenge? Um, work out whether you really want to do it. And I think, um, I think that was the biggest thing for me. Like the seeds had kind of been planted and it was growing, but I really needed to work out whether I really wanted to do it enough to justify it because if you don't want it enough there will be so many times where it's just feels impossible no matter how badly or quick or you know well your race is going out how many quickly or slowly you're going doing it there will be times where it's just too easy to stop and I think knowing your why and knowing that you really 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 want it is the most important thing because it is you know it's a massive sacrifice it's a massive financial investment like you know it's over a thousand pounds for this rack we could have done it staying in four-star hotels (laughs) three course dinners had it way less money (laughs) you're paying a thousand pounds for some crappy hostel (laughs) beds and a few bits of lasagna it is financially it's a matter yeah so work out your why and I think I always said this with Iron Man don't do it just because you think you should or it's the next step or you've got to really know that you really want to do it because otherwise you probably won't won't bring yourself to get around it it's super tough you look at the DNF rate as well the odds I say this pretty much every week these big long races the odds are stacked against you just getting to the finish these events mm. let's talk about your why lucy because uh it moves on very succinct, succinctly kerry allison uh watched lucy's dot in awe so very proud as she is the co-founder of the initiative 5k your way move against cancer she's then put google it i am a very proud ambassador for the shrewsbury group who whether they like it or not get twice daily updates from me about lucy one of my fellow ambassadors said his six-year-old son was gripped with the dot watching and asked could they could he go and do it next weekend <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well done, Lucy. I don't think you realise yet what you've achieved. Oh, it's a lovely message from Kerry. Could we talk about the move against cancer charity and the 5K your way? Who's it for and how does it help? Oh, this is like my, this has been my passion project for the last, it's nearly six years actually. So yeah, Kerry's amazing. She'd be, I need to get Kerry on our podcast, but she'd be an amazing guest for your podcast. What she does ah. is... Quite incredible. Yes, you should you should talk to her. Move Against Cancer uh, supports, inspires and empowers people living with and after cancer to be active. Um, so the background is there's loads of evidence that one of the best things anyone with cancer can do um, to make themselves feel better, but probably also improve their outcome is exercise. But the classic advice and the classic perception is that you need to rest if you've got cancer, which is absolute nonsense. The Move Charity, as it, as it were, was founded by this amazing lady called Gemma in 2016 so Gemma was a runner she got diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma um, when she was 26 she realized there was no support for her to get back into running after treatment or stay active during her treatment and she set up Move Charity with the help of her haematologist Fiona um, and the goal was to support other young people going through cancer treatment to stay active. I met Gemma about a year later my kind of involvement like I was kind of aware of the benefits of exercise and I just met a young guy on the cancer ward who'd had a brain tumor and theoretically he'd been cured of the brain tumor but in the process he had lost 
his friends, he lost his family, he lost his job, he put on several stone in weight and he was spending all day asleep and all night awake playing computer games. And I just remember walking away and thinking, what is like, what are we doing if that's, yeah, you're curing people, but actually that's the life that we're leaving them with. And I love Park Run and I just had this idea, well, maybe we could get a group of young people to train up towards doing a Park Run every three months, talk to people in the hospital, they poo-pooed it. Um, heard about Gemma I was like all right let's reach out to Gemma she, and Gemma mm. and I just realized we have the you know the same vision the same passion and so that's how 5k your way move against cancer kind of was first formed so yeah we're an active support group uh, with a difference and we just meet at part runs um, each group's led by volunteer ambassadors like Kerry all of whom have been affected by cancer in some way and people walk, jog, run, cheer, or volunteer as much of the 5K as they want, and then just go for a coffee. Really simple, but really powerful. We started it just as one group in Nottingham. And I think we now got 95 groups across the UK and Ireland, which is just wow. incredible. Wow. So 5K UA is now part of Move Against Cancer Charity. So it's one whole charity. We've got an online program, which is an eight-week one-to-one online program for young people when they finish their cancer treatment. Um, and it's about helping them build activity back into their lives in a way that they can do kind of on their own in their home building back their confidence building back their belief in their body the other bit which is a work in progress is the resources so every week I get emailed by people saying just been diagnosed with cancer can I do this on chemo how do I run on chemo etc so um, we're trying to build this kind of hub of resources so that when people email me I can say go and look at this (laughs) So we've got a podcast and we do online workshops and things. Um, yeah, so I've been I've been kind of so heavily involved in initially just by K your way, and then when COVID came with the resources and, and the whole charity, I believe in it so much. I know like it's an absolute game changer. It does change people's lives. It's so simple, but um, cancer takes away so much control and movement is 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 one way that people can get that back. Yeah, I'm not paid by the charity. And I never will be. I never want to be. It's just something I believe in that makes me so happy. You know, it gets stressful along the way sometimes, particularly the bigger you get. I come back to this lady called Sue. She died, God, two years ago, something like that now. But she was 70. She had never run in her life. She got diagnosed with metastatic bowel cancer. And she saw a flyer in the hospital and she said to her family, when I get out of here, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. And her family were like, what? You don't, you don't have run her, like you're 70. And she turned up at the Nottingham 5K UA group and she built up from walking it to running a bit of it to running the whole thing. And she wow. has an amazing it's video wonderful. of her. And she says, when people ask me how I am, I don't talk about the bad stuff. I tell them I've started running. And that's kind of my why and just seeing the difference it can make to to so many people affected by cancer kind of psychologically but actually also knowing the evidence showing that exercises it's one of the very few things that anyone with cancer can do to to not just make themselves feel better but probably also improve how they'll they'll do with their cancer um so yeah it's an amazing charity and because of my friend nikki bartlett we raised twenty five thousand pounds without gift aid so over thirty thousand pounds i I literally cannot believe that. I, I, I it's just blow me away. And for a small charity, like that's such a massive sum of money. I guess that's partly why I wanted to do this podcast, even despite everything, because I feel that needs to be celebrated. Mm. And um, yeah, I'm just so grateful. Like the P- Jasmine Paris donated. How did she hear about it? Yeah, yes, of course <laughs> she did. She'd have been. She, she, Lucy Charles Barkley, Jasmine, they were all over it. I know, Tom Evans, I saw too. Yeah. So, Tom um, Evans, they were like. So what was it like uh, watching it the donations rolling in? That must have been well, I wild. didn't know. I mean, afterwards, obviously, I didn't. I didn't know. Like Bex had kind of said, you know, I, I had a vague idea. Bex is very understated, and she said, "Nick is doing a good job with storytelling. You're getting a lot of support." Bex is Nick's partner, so Bex knew everything that was coming further down the line. So I don't know how she held it all together, but yeah, I, I kind of like realized probably from Bex's very understated thing that you people were were supporting me, but I. I was blown away. And yeah, I think over that last day, watching, you know, the the slower I was going, the more people were throwing money at me. <laughs> yes, I think it was meant to be, you know, your pathway there. Like if you jogged across the Cheviots and been like, yes, good 
guys. I this think is the easy. Fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that the fa- well, the fact you had, you know, we we engaged with you because we saw you on the stories, and Nikki did such a great job. So we kind of knew, oh, she's having a, most of the stories were really positive, and you were really with it. And everyone was like, she's so with it. So you sort of reeled us in like a Netflix program like that, <laughs> and then so we were all there, and then you hit the cheviots, and then it all went quite quiet, and then the dot was, yeah. and then but we were like, oh my gosh, and I think. People, the, you know, people love suffering. They love the suffering and they love, you know, and so every every penny that people donated was for, for what you did. Not only what you did, but how you handled yourself out there with like um, with such grace and you, you wore your heart on your sleeve. And that's what the spine race is all about. Can people still donate? Can we get you yeah, up to I'm gonna keep it open? Bobby, I don't know, for another few weeks. And um, yeah, I, I promise you I've, as a small. So my PhD was funded by Cancer Research UK and got a hell of a lot of money and it achieved very little in the grand scheme of things. Um, Donating to small charities, your money goes a lot further. And I know there are so many charities out there, but um, we we do make your money kind of go a long way. And actually what we achieve with the number of paid staff we have is is pretty phenomenal but I I just want to say yeah massive thank you to everyone and if anyone does still want to donate then yeah just giving page is still open um and yeah thank you well 25 grand must be quite a large chunk of your annual income yeah like well over 15 percent I think wow okay yeah that's huge fantastic so what does Lucy Gossage do next now you've conquered the Ironman you've conquered the spine well, is there no, I don't think I could have answered this before Tuesday, let alone now. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? I, I honestly don't know. I um... Anything entered for the rest of the year? No, no. Left it all as an open slate. So I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, don't know. I think I need to see how I recover. I did really enjoy, which I hadn't had because I've been retired for four years, this reason to, to train. And, and mm. I guess over the last few years, <clears throat> I've trained to be fit enough for adventures. But actually... I did enjoy when I didn't want to go to the gym, thinking actually, no, this was your non-negotiable, you're going to go to the gym. I liked having that that why again. I loved that unknown. And I, I guess if I did another one, it would never be that unknown. It would be it would be a bit about performance because it can't not be about performance because yeah. I've just shown I'm relatively good at, you know, suffering <laughs> or slogging it out. Mm. And I, I don't know whether that's something I, you know, I've done that that part of life it would never be the same level so I don't know um but that's not a reason not to do stuff but I think I would go into into it again knowing that I was probably likely to be the you know at the sharp end of the race not at the front end of the race but in the sharpish end and that does change things a bit I think it doesn't have to like you're so grounded you've got enough experience and you just go in you handle exactly the same way that you did you focus on yourself and your fueling and you learn from what you did last time and you change a few things and the other big thing about these really long races is that everyone each one is so different I learned that like well like I can go back like the week later. I was like, I'm entering again. I'm going back. I could do this. Mm. Bryn was like, yeah, but it'll never be the same because the weather will be different. Something will happen. You know, you can't re- try and recreate it. And But when you do something, Michael, as well, it lives in your, it takes over your brain, the, not only the preparation, but then I think afterwards it, it stays with you for so long. And so I mm. think having there's no rush to do anything this year. You're so good at like the adventures and having lovely days out and just letting just letting it be soaking in what you did was absolutely amazing soak in what you've done you were absolutely amazing out there gosh we loved your dot so much oh, we loved and it. It's so inspiring yeah oh and thank you well yeah i was just blown away by all the messages and yeah i li- literally can't even yeah can't even put into words how blown away i was to see all these people they know that never cared about triathlon (laughs) (laughs) you sucked them all in right we we know you have to dash because you've got another meeting but can we quickly do the quick five if they're proper quick Mm -hmm. inspiration for eddie actually your favorite bike workout god i haven't done one uh 40 20s let's do that one (gasps) oh good it's one of my favorite is lucy does it eddie will do it (laughs) yes once a week i make myself do 40 20s on the bike and i yeah i hate it because also my legs are always so tired from running so the first uh, few i'm like i can't do it 
but it I think it really helps your running that power. You need good to session. create that um, yeah, good session. Good. Okay. Guilty TV pleasure. Oh, traitors. I'm watching that at the moment. Yay! Yes. We're all of traitors. We're all on it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Eddie and I famished knocking on your door. We are so hungry. What are you going to rustle us up? What is your signature dish? I don't think I have a signature dish. I'm not a bad cook. I don't know. I don't think I have a signature dish. How do you get those 4,000 calories in? What's the main <laughs> food stuff? I eat really well. Like, like, I cook well. I guess, like, short notice, I'd probably do a prawn spaghetti tomorrow. You're veggie, though, aren't you? Um, and prawns yeah. are, like, the thing that if you... They're, like, my torture food. So, like, oh, um, it was going I, so I well. make a, a veggie chilli, quick and easy. I don't know. I don't have a signature dish. I'm not... I, like, I, I need to follow recipes. I'm not a... Yeah, we'll just open the cupboard. We can all help out. We'll just be chatting anyway. It'll be fine. We should do that. <laughs> quick quick dish, slow dish. What would be your fast, fast dish? Next question is, yeah, we're going to go back to your teenage years. What posters would we see on your bedroom wall? Oh, I had Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Titanic. Excellent. Um, he was hot in that. He was hot in that. <laughs> I used to have a on Macaulay Culkin as well, which... <laughs> um, yeah, that was, I wasn't really a poster, but no, Leonardo was the only guy, really, that I had a poster for. He would have been on a lot of people's walls. He had such lovely hair in Titanic. <laughs> I should but watch that again. Eddie and I can't be trusted with the Instagram story music. Uh, but yeah, every week we share the podcast over on Instagram and we can't put a song to your Instagram oh, story. Sweet Caroline. Sweet Caroline. Yeah. Yeah. That was going to be, I had visions <laughs> of running down that hill from the Cheviot with that blaring out, dancing my way to the finish. But sadly, <laughs> shuffled my way with some guy talking at me. Oh, <laughs> but that would be my song. So, I mean, he's lovely, that guy. I hope, I he, hope he's not listening. He was so he lovely. Was. But just sometimes you just want to pick that. your moment. I think that's wonderful. I think that sums up the spine. How you envisage it and how, how it's portrayed <laughs> on social media and how it actually is. Oh, Lucy, we're sending you the biggest love from Tea and Trail Keep oh, towers. You. Keep keeping in touch. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's www.justgiving.com slash page slash Lucy Gossage Spine Move. But we'll put it all in the show notes. We'll put it all over Instagram. Let's get her, let's get her up a few more thousands up on that for what was an incredible achievement. Thank you for giving us such entertainment. Just like the traitors, I logged on and see what was happening. And enjoy, take your time with your recovery. Enjoy it. Savor. Savor all, all those cankles. Thank you very much. And yeah, good luck with um, the Northern Traverse. Lots of love, awesome. Lucy. Take care. Yeah, bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 What an inspiration, Gary. That was a real emotion. Yeah, interview, wasn't it that uh, it was going to be an emotional interview anyway, just from uh, so close to finishing the spine, how well she did. I love the way she spoke very candidly about her uh, experience out there on the spine. And uh, I love that about her. Why she's such a good doctor, I'm sure. Raised an incredible amount of money. That Just Giving page is still open. So if you've been inspired by Lucy or perhaps cancer has touched your life in a way that it's probably touched a lot of our lives, pop over to its www.justgiving.com slash page slash Lucy Gossage Spine Move. There's lots of other words, but I'm sure you can find it if you pop over to Just Giving. I'll pop a link. Pop a link. Pop a link in the show notes. What ledge loose? And we look forward to hearing what you're going to do now. She's back training already. She's back doing more hours than you, Gary. Strava, another clean sweep. I never thought it would happen, and now it's happened twice. Uh, pretty Incredible. close to each other. Incredible! What a day to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> Alice Moore or more, it depends on the part of your country, 144.9 miles, time on feet, 42 hours, 8 minutes and 36 seconds, and elevation, 35,850 feet. You might remember Alice posted a comment in the Facebook group uh, asking a question about caffeine. Yeah, hopefully she got some sage advice from our community and she's been taking part in the Hong Kong Four Trails Ultra Challenge over the Chinese New Year. And my goodness me, it looks amazing. Absolutely awesome. Strava, thing of beauty. Yeah, well done, well done, Alice. And it's wild over on Strava. 
100 miles won't even get you in the top three. And all of the top 100, I can't scroll past. I don't think I can scroll past 100. Anyway, they've all completed at least 50 miles, all of the top 100. Kudos and kudos to all of our Strava Club members. It's so inspiring seeing you show up day after day and week after week. You won't, but I follow Claire Bamworth, who won the spine two years in a row oh, on Strava. What is she up to? Whoa. She, whoa. That's all I can say. <laughs> so I was going, I did a bit of a deep dive because I, you know, I like to, I always like to see how people train what you're doing. She does stuff like goes out seven o'clock at night and runs 30 to 40 miles and then will get up the next day and run another like 20 miles, be out again the door at like 10 o'clock. But she runs really slowly, Gary. Okay. On 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 comparison is the fact she's winning all these mega races. And then you look at the pace that she's, what is she doing? So then again, I've gone to try and like analyze. I'm like, are you doing walk jogs? Or is it because the volume is so high? There's no sessions, Gary, from what I can see. It looks just like, I mean, she ran 150 miles, I think, the week after the spine. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> you should that's go, yep. Absolute. It is, Matt, she also is biking like an hour a day. She's not, I mean. Does she work? She does work. She does work. She does work. But I'm so interested. I'm like, so there's Gary, like absolutely sweating it out on the treadmill. And you're running like 14 minute mile pace for 30 miles every single day. Like the training difference is, goes to show, doesn't it? I mean. But how does that translate to her race pace though, her training But then pace. she ran 10 miles. In 102, I think she did a 10 mile race. She's got fast. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. She got some wheels in. That's, <laughs> that's like. Real. But I think as long as you can look at it, like just look at it for interest, look at how different every, everybody does, everybody yeah. trains differently and, and massive volume. I mean, she gets the results, but like you don't know what, how the rest of life can be. I mean, she surely she can't be cleaning her bathrooms with that amount of volume going on. She's not folding five loads of laundry before 7 a.m., is she? I get, I get pretty when I see somebody and they're doing like uh say a low seven minute mile and i just think wow and i'm not judging anybody but when i know what maybe their half marathon time is or the marathon time and i just think that's that's a hard run for you why why are you running everything at that pace uh it does but it's wild you know it's how everybody approaches training differently and just because we have a strava club it's not for everybody lots of my clients don't like the strava they don't like having people seeing their runs and they don't like the uh, pressure that they get. On, you can completely um, make it private. It can be all your thing. You don't have to share it, any of it, do you? It's a bit but like what's the point? a private Instagram, isn't it? What, yeah. what are you doing? It's true. Social. That's true. Anyway. See, oh, I get told off if I do that bit. Step back, Edwina. <laughs> Step back. But I'm not allowed to do the Strava bit and I'm not allowed to do the Tales from the Trails. The only really bit I'm allowed to do is at the start and then you basically do the rest of the podcast. So I'm beginning to think, you know, soon maybe I'll just be allowed to do the intro. And then you'll Get just AI, go, AI yeah, 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 yeah. I need to tell you all about my 6 by one k <laughs> Tales from the Trails. Do you want to do this bit or should I do it? Oh! Who did the last tales from the trails? We didn't have one last week. Was it you the week before that? Oh, like I'm gonna remember that. Uh, come on, I'll do it. Oh, I should step there you go. I don't Sorry, need... everybody. If you like Eddie, you're not gonna get to hear her because it's all the Gary show. <laughs> <laughs> These are what, what, tales from the trails. Read it aloud is a test for me, so I always feel I should I know, force I myself forever. To do it. But I try and put my kind face on. <laughs> Just like oh no pressure. Well, <laughs> I wish I hadn't said it. Now, I love running on the trails, and as I come from Scotland, we are never sure of some beautiful routes. But I have always been accident prone, and I would take it as a win if I got home with the knees of my leggings intact. I would face plant regularly, but. I think all the practice gave me a technique for falling that was more traumatic for the people running with me than for me. A few scuffs and cuts were all that happened. And other than ending up with knees like a 12-year-old boy scout, no real damage was done. I would just bounce up and hobble on before getting back into my stride. That was until one day when running with my friend who was a nurse on a lovely frosty autumn day. I went down and burst my knee open. I rolled onto my back, turning white with pain. <gasps> it took my breath away and I felt nausea rising. My friend was very concerned and kneeled beside me to tell me just to lie there for a minute and let the faint feeling 
us, I managed to whisper to him, no, there's a jobby. He immediately, he immediately went into caring nurse mode and reassured <laughs> me that I wasn't to worry. We would deal with it. Perhaps tie my jacket round my waist and get me back to the car without too much embarrassment. It took me a minute, but I realised he thought I had lost control of my bowels with the trauma <laughs> of the fall. I wasted no time in clarifying that. Going by my sense of smell, I was very close to having dog poop stuck to the back of my head. <laughs> and he better get me up quick smart. Ah, the dangers of autumn leaves combined with irresponsible dog owners smiley emoji it was good to know that my friend would have been there for me regardless i'm not so sure i would have been luckily it was a near miss and i got away with not having to do an alfresco shampoo in the river i can't imagine what the journey home would have been like my knee was a mess but healed eventually and we have had a good laugh recounting the tale Hi. ruth kelly thanks for that ruth oh my goodness me burst knee that just sounds like agony Mm. We asked, and you delivered. Do, do, do. Right, I'm going to read the longest one. Great company. Thanks by Karen Court. Hello, all. Hello, Karen. Listen to your podcast with Jack Scott, and you said you didn't have a five star review to read out. So here is one for you. Me and my husband, Steve, normally watch your podcasts on YouTube. Oh, I always pretend that people don't actually watch us on YouTube because my face is so old. Yes. And I've got no bra on. <laughs> well you know when you come back from a run you don't gary but i take my sports bra off and if i'm running twice which i am today i just leave it to dry and then i put it back on again so i just go loosey-goosey for the rest loosey -goosey. of the day anyway karen i'm so sorry i've ruined your i've ruined your review me and my husband steve normally watch your podcast on youtube we sit down at night after a challenging day at work and it gives us some light relief and a good laugh this is very highly intellectual podcast we talked about the russians smuggling finished cheese i hope you learned something Thing too. Edwina is a breath of fresh air. I'm glad you used my full name. And Gary is such a genuine guy. You both work well together. The brew with the coaches is so informative. And as we are both beginner trail runners training for our first ultra, the information is a huge help. On this occasion, we decided to listen to the podcast with Jack Scott on our long run. It was also the first time we wore our shocks headphones on a run. It made our long run, which was also two hours long, fly by. And I actually witnessed my husband laughing while he was running, which is a rare occurrence. I think we all know which part he's laughing at. Thank you for all the work you do to put this all together. Karen and Steve Court. Stars now. Oh, geez. Karen and Steve, you're running now. We love you. Thanks for the review. Keep them coming in. Leave another one. Leave it a week. Just write write another one again. <laughs> if you are watching on YouTube, I apologize for both my hair and my general outlook. But Gary raises the looks level with his classic high definition. Thought. And I just bring the real, I bring the rustic farmyard sort of vibe. Thank you so much for taking time. We have got some five star reviews to read now, but keep them coming. We love them. We love them. We love knowing that people do actually listen to this. Ordling. It's not just dad. Competition. Big bobble hat to kindly supply the prizes for our latest comp. You don't need to do anything apart from being a paid up patron, legend tier and above. And I'll spin the wheel on <gasps> Sunday, the 18th of Feb, about seven o'clock. Spin the wheel. Spin the wheel. Where's that from? There was a game show where uh, spin the wheel. It goes tick, 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 Wheel of Fortune. I don't know. I don't know. You, just, you used to, must have used to watch Wheel of Fortune. We loved all that kind of TV. Blankety oh, Blank Generation Game. Love oh, them yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Love them all. And my kids love them all now. And I just, oh, I'm like, oh my God, we need another television. I can't believe. They're like, oh. <laughs> it's great celebrity chase something or others on them. Like, oh, my God. oh, I don't like the celebrity stuff. I like the, the real people. Really, people we'll like you and me gather. Yeah. Right. What? Are you gonna have another bad week of ninety miles, three sessions, three strengths, and? Uh... <laughs> I'm not going to talk about my sessions because uh, that's next week's content. Ooh, keep us, keep your audience guessing. <laughs> But I didn't get my Scott Super Track Speed RC upload done just yet. The week ran away with me. So fingers crossed, fingers crossed. I need to feed the YouTube algorithm so I'll get that done. Maybe the relays on Saturday. 
If I can get a lift, I can't at least as a way. I'm home alone. So I'd love to run for Sedgefield. I think we could put in a V50 team by Rock Up, but I'm going to struggle to get there. So if I can get some transport. I Are you putting be... that out on the podcast in the hope that someone listening? But it's too late, is isn't it? It's going to be on Friday. So it's uh, really is a Saturday, but uh, we'll see. Still time, my... 24 hours. How long is the journey? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not far, actually. <laughs> but then on Sunday, Bob Graham round leg one in reverse. I nearly said recce. It's not a recce. I'm not planning on doing a Bob another Bob Graham round anytime soon, but looking forward to it. But then this is where, like you rightly called me out, my love for the trails will never... Yeah, because how much of that is going to be running? <laughs> not a lot. I, I imagine the bogs are going to be pretty much like Henrietta. Yeah, she ran it though. I think all, every time you switch to a hike, going, oh, Henrietta would have run this. She definitely would have run this. Well, I think it's going to be pretty messy down there and on the common too. So we'll say, but yeah, this is why I'll never be live up to any potential. Oh God, I really feels awkward seeing that too. But my marathon time, my road marathon time will never be as good as what it maybe could be because I just enjoy the trails too much. Home Alone on Sunday, like I said, I've got a phone call with uh, Emily from Precision Fuel and Hydration at 12 o'clock today. Oh, oh I thought you were going to say on Sunday. I was going to like, oh, poor Emily, she has to talk to you on a Sunday. <laughs> I think it's two o'clock. It's just double check. Yes, two o'clock because it is actually nearly 12 o'clock. Ah. Uh, Pancakes. I had pancakes this morning, actually. Oh, you've had them already? Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, we can have ours tonight. Everyone has to have a broccoli ham and cheese one first in our house. Sausage for me. Oh, sausage. I love a, I love a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> even before breakfast, I don't mind a sausage. <laughs> and, and then it's Lent. Back on Lent. So what are you doing? Sh- what are you doing? It's the usual, the sugary treats. That'll be been kicked into touch for 40 days and 40 nights. But there, there's always huge caveats, you know, if I'm going to, so if I'm doing a, a recce, uh-huh. reverse recce. You know, I seem to remember you having a load of stuff in the car <laughs> on a drive home during Lent. And you said because you were still in your running kit, you ate it all because you felt like it was still part of the run. So I'm not sure baby Jesus did that in the desert, 40 days, 40 nights. Yeah, it's quite loose, my. <laughs> <laughs> the line is quite blurry, but yeah. Uh, trying to sack off the trees but again you know if it's somebody's birthday I'm not going to be that guy is it your birthday is it your birthday do you have like a half year birthday because we could have a cake should we have a cake it's not my birthday it's nobody's going. birthday it's nobody's birthday oh. unfortunately that is my week obviously got sessions to come but like I say I'll share that with you next week what about you lords to do this week right Pat my northern traverse bag went through the kit list which when you've done the spine it's like well what do you want just to suppose you just want me to have a pack of the tissues and a base layer i weighed it so I put everything in without i will probably take a little bit more like what well depending on the weather there's a warm weather kit and there's a cold weather kit that you might be called upon to have you don't have to carry it with you unless they tell you to carry it with you but i would probably uh carry it anyway because um you get so cold in the night when you're going so slow <laughs> especially us but and the first night we're quite we're in the lake district me it's still coming just out of the lake district maybe so i'll know yeah. more after the recce where i'm m- roughly might be as well when you get to like one of the support points is there a facility for you to get a few get i think there's wings? tents yeah there's tents you've got to have okay. a sleeping bag and a roll mat and your drop bag yeah so i weighed it it's about three kilograms which is quite heavy actually i thought with no fuel. That did have bottles in it, but it didn't have fuel in. So it will probably be about three and a half, maybe even a little bit more. So bit I'm going to yeah. start wearing. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to start running with it now. I ran with it on Monday. And I'm going to go bigger pack because if you want to take like a warmer coat, but then you want to take it off, you don't want to be. I was going to take my 12 litre, but that can fit all the um, mandatory kit in. But then when you're tired and you're faffing, and you, just, you know, Gary, you just want to get yeah. stuff out and put it in. And then you might want to run in a warmer coat and then during the night. And then you, where do you put it? So I'm going to take my spine pack. It's been there, it's done that. I feel emotionally attached to Rog. Next, I need to get my lucky poles back out. I've not used them. Obviously used them skiing, but I've not used them hiking. I want to get the ones which I I can't remember what they're called. I think they're called the Neo Trail or something that have got the loop around the handle rather than the gloves. That's personal preference. I like the shark grip. Yep. So I need to get those back out, work out 
carrying, using, you know, get my head, get my head in the game. This Thursday, oh, yo, yo, I'm going to get, yeah, I'm going to get the backpack out and uh, I'm going to push. I've done quite a few now, three hour runs, long runs, um, and I'm going to go out for four hours this Thursday because I find the three hours now, I'm, I'm getting sore by the three hours. So the fourth, the fourth hour, Why not? <laughs> I need, I need to slow down a bit because like okay. my gap pace is about nine minute miles for those runs, which obviously is way too fast. So I need to slow down and get a little bit more. So I'm not so sore afterwards. And also, so it's more pace, absolutely specific now. So yeah. that's what, but I, I often run with friends on Thursday and then I feel guilty because they are out for just like their long run two hours. They don't want to walk. everything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I never quite went, get that right. I never quite get the balance of the race specific pace. I know. Yeah. So it's getting the right balance, isn't it? Between uh, if you're with someone who's actually doing the races you, with you and it's the same pace, you can you can dial it in. I was really strict with that when I was doing the spine training. I just say to my friends, right. Also with the spine pack, it's so heavy. You like, as soon as you run uphill, you're like, <laughs> so it sort of naturally slows you down. Um, so yeah, I'll see, but I will try and like keep that super cruisy. I mean, I keep them super cruisy anyway, but even more super cruisy. See if I can come away with it with slightly, <laughs> the Thursday, the afternoon where I always come home, then I have lunch and I'll, I'll put my um, compression boots on, which I love for like half an hour. And then when I get up, I'm so stiff, Gary. I'm so, I'm like, are these like the Normatec? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. I thought I've got old lady boots. Oh, no. Rubbish. They are incroyable. I love them. I've had them. I've used them for many years. For old lady legs, they are really good. Interesting. I thought they yeah. were just a load of expensive rubbish. No, I like them. Mm. Anyway, another podcast, another day. Uh, I've just started a new strength plan, Gary. So new sessions. Jesus, Jesus. One of them is so hard that the last bit I have to actually do my labor breathing that I did when I gave birth to the kids. <laughs> the- <laughs> you know, when I read your notes, I thought it said birthday breathing. And I thought, what You're the like, hell is birthday breathing? <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah, that's hard. The first week is always the hardest and it does get slightly easier. I am definitely so much stronger. Next week, I'll keep that quite heavy weight and then I'll get rid of, I'll keep the strength in, but it will become movement rather than as I do a couple of, we do our big recce and I do a couple of longer days too. But it's all good because I was looking at the profile of the Northern Traverse and there's hills at the start, but they'll be fine because you'll be fresh. In yeah. the first 100k, there's like for about 1,500, 1,800 feet worth of climbing four times, basically, roughly. But that will be like pretty, you know, stomp up them, jog down. It won't be mentally, well, it might be, it might be feeling rubbish, but it won't be like, but then the back end, the, the last bit of the course, there's then quite a little bit of spicy climbing too. And you could, like like I did over the Cheviots, you could lose hours on that. So hopefully the strength work, that's what the focus is on, those, that last bit. I will be just flying up those hills, Gary. Just flying up those hills. They're a lot different, the hills on the moors, though. You know, instead of a half an hour climb, probably more like five minutes, ten minutes tops. Little truck. Well, well I'll remind you of that when we're <laughs> on the last day of the recce. <laughs> Getting a little bit more specific now, just trying to get them done, Gary, without sitting on the sofa and <laughs> watching. We started watching One Day on Netflix. Oh, <gasps> I don't know what this do is. Do it. Do it. My friend said one. Another it's another one. From Eddie. Yeah, it's really good. It's quite emotional. It but it's not like two... 10 seasons in, is it? We like... No, no, no. It's only, I think it's only one. It's a story. It's going to be done. Okay. You, I think. I don't know the outcome of it yet. We're halfway through. It's like half an hour each episode. And it starts off these these people meet at university. So me and Brim were, of course, like, we go right down a rabbit hole of um, reminiscing. Um, it's really good. Really emotional. Lots of dialogue, which is the sort of drama I like. Loads of dialogue, loads of emotions and no killing. My perfect sort of viewing. That's it. Another show in the bank. And if you are still running, kudos. Wow, you are doing awesome. Think of the strength you are building. Make sure you dig into that fuel and drink now. And don't leave it until you get home. We all know what happens the minute you get through the door. Thanks to Precision Fuel and Hydration for sponsoring this week's show. And use code T24 for 15% off your first order. Thanks to all partners on Patreons too. We couldn't do this without you and your ongoing support. And be kind to future self. Breathe and believe. Progress, not perfection. Keep your shield high. 
And don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, give us a share. Whatever you're doing, keep sharing your awesome running pictures. We love seeing all your adventures being shared on Facebook or the Gram. Keep listening to the UK's, we've just given this this title to ourselves. There's actually no scientific evidence behind it. Uh, Self-proclaimed. <laughs> Self-proclaimed. Number one trail running podcast. Warm yourself up with your favourite brew. My name is Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwits. And that was episode 59 of the Tea and Tales podcast. <laughs>